It's time for Windows Weekly. Richard Campbell has the week off. He's in London. Paul Therat is here. We've got a lot of Microsoft earnings to talk about. It was an interesting quarter. Revenue was up. Profit was down. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about the classic uh, Nintendo 64 game coming to Xbox. And is the future of Windows advertising? All that and a whole lot more coming up next on Windows Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therat, episode 813, recorded Wednesday, January 25th, 2023. Usage Intensity. Windows Weekly is brought to you by ACI Learning. If you love IT Pro, you'll love ACI Learning. ACI Learning offers fully customizable training for your team in formats for all types of learners across audit, cybersecurity, and IT. From entry-level training to putting people on the moon, ACI Learning has you covered. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit to learn more. Thanks for listening to this show as an ad-supported network. We are always looking for new partners with products and services that will benefit our qualified audience. Are you ready to grow your business? Reach out to advertise at twit.tv and launch your campaign now. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show where we cover uh, Windows and Microsoft and all that <laughs> stuff. Not so much HoloLens. Yeah, yeah. That's Paul Therat. Little Pauly T. Therat.com. T-H-U-R-R-O. Double good. Dot com. And, of course, his books are at leanpub.com, including the fabulous new field guide to Windows. Onces. <laughs> That's right. Thank uh, you. Yes. Bentanas on says. Yes. You know all of that <laughs> that lingo, don't you? Yeah. No, not much of it. <laughs> but. I saw it. Now, I, you got me a little nervous. Because yeah. I saw on your Insta that you got your residency papers for Mexico. Right. What What does that mean? Are you, are, does that mean you so can... So it's, it means we can spend more than 180 days in a row there. So ah. it's a, um, we, we have to complete the process in Mexico, but we're going to get, I, this doesn't seem accurate to me, but the people at the consulate described it as basically their version of a green card. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's just a it's just a, a step of the process. After four years, we'll get. Um, <gasps> There's a cat. I see a cat. Yeah. I used to see. I used to be able to keep the cats out of my office, but now now he's in the basement where the cats I live. Can't, I can't stop them because there's a little hole in the door for them. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that would imply that you plan to spend more than six months at a time in your new hacienda in Mexico Leo, City. I can uh, neither confirm nor deny any such plans. <laughs> but <laughs> hey, if I were you, I would, especially winter. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, but does it get cold? Because it's at altitude. It's pretty high. No, it is super consistent. I would nice. say it's within ten degrees plus. You know, a high and low. So. Right. I mean, the days right now are in the high 70s. The nights are in the uh, high 40s. Nice. Very, yeah. it's like here, pretty consistent. Very consistent. Yeah. 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 Except we have other temperatures. But when it's that temperature, it's very consistent yeah. for a while. Oh, that's yeah. nice. I would, if I were you, I'm still uh, eyeing that uh, penthouse across the street. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a nice we, neighborhood. Yeah. Oh, I, you know what I. And I know you have a variety of food in Mexico City, including sushi, oh the best sushi, yeah. which yeah. is weird because you're inland. And, I but know, anyway, I know. Uh, I just uh, when we were in Cancun, they had other kinds of restaurants. I said, let's just eat the Mexican food. It's so good. Lo yeah, real you Mexican for a week food or whatever is incredible. But you get yes, sick of it. Yeah, yeah. You like it's like anything else. You yeah, know, you yes, want variety. Variety. Yeah. Well, you got it. Yep. There's no Denny's though. Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Think there's a Denny's. I That's mean, you know. So every once you in know a while. what's surprisingly good in Mexico are hamburgers. I know that sounds kind of weird. Hamburguesas. But, uh, hamburguesas. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, very, very good in Mexico. Mm, my mouth is watering now. <laughs> I know. All right. Uh, we should probably talk about Microsoft since there is some yeah, news. This is our uh, quarterly earnings learnings report. Do -do 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 -do. This just in. Microsoft <laughs> net income down, revenue up. I don't know yeah. how that works. 
Splainus. Well, re net, net income is just profits, right? It's profit. I, I don't. You made so they, they, they took in more money, but they they kept less of it. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> yes. Okay. And actually, uh, right. So their revenues only went up two percent. So that's the, the the lowest gain in over six years. I think that's notable. I believe that Microsoft is the first of the big tech companies to report earnings this month. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens across the board. I know Amazon's supposed to be a a dumpster fire. I mean, we'll see what happens with the other companies. But for Microsoft, I would say uh, let there be no debate over whether moving to the cloud was the smart thing for this company. Oh, yeah. Because if it wasn't for that, that <laughs> We'd be selling this thing at a yard sale right now. I want to um, give uh, Satya Nadella a lot of credit because not only did he, although as we talked last week, if if it weren't for Balmer setting it up, you know, yep. teeing him up so that he could roll that That's strike, right. uh, he wouldn't have been able to do it. But he definitely did that move. And now I have to say I'm very impressed. It looks like, you know, Ben Thompson at Stratechery had a good article about AI and the big five and its yep. impact. Yep. And he said Microsoft was best positioned to take yeah. advantage of this. And he called AI the next epic, you know, in, in you know, PCs, well, this is the, the internet. Yeah, this is the next the next wave is Microsoft. The next wave. Called. Right, that's that's exactly right. So it's interesting because Microsoft missed the smartphone wave, which seemed to be like a death blow, um, but they were propped up with the cloud. I mean, the cloud is one of those, cloud is infrastructure. It's kind of, we don't really think of it as an epoch or a wave or whatever, but obviously it's huge, huge business um, for Microsoft and Amazon and other companies. He, he, uh, Thompson calls it a wave. He said, and he had the same. Oh, he does. Okay. Yeah. He okay. said the same thing. He said, you know, you might not think cloud is a wave, but it is a wave. Okay. Uh, good. And, yeah. And I mean, so think, Microsoft's yeah, done very well catching that one. And, and it looks like maybe they're well positioned to catch the next wave. Such as a good surfer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they missed a few waves. But they missed <laughs> the, sure. they, you know, almost missed the internet. Um, Bill Gates, you know, yeah. grabbed it at the last moment. Uh, they definitely well, missed you know. mobile. Yeah, and and that's sad because they were in mobile from the very I beginning. Um, I, I man, I gotta, I'm gonna I'm gonna punt my cat out of this. <laughs> She's like bumping into I my hands. I don't mind. It's talking. you know we miss Sirachi. So uh, what's her name? What's this kid's you don't name? See her. I'm not gonna tell you her name. Who cares? No, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> Kitty. No, we we'll have call two, her Kitty. Two, we have two cats. Uh, you dancer, don't know, do you? Dash, Dasher and Dancer. This Dasher is a small and dancer. one. Oh. Dasher is the smaller of the two. I um. I refer to them as Big Cat and Little Cat. This is Little Cat. Um, oh, I just said her name and she squawked. She's like, Yeah, I'm Little Cat. She heard me talking down here, so she assumed naturally oh. I wanted to, you know, give her some. We have one anyway. cat that has a Siamese, I swear. I mean, she's a black cat, but I think she has some Siamese because she's a wow. Like Siamese, you know, that wow. Oh, these cats, they're, wow. they squawk so much now. I, They have taken me yelling at them to mean that I'm interacting with them. Oh, it's good. He's things. talking to us. <laughs> yeah, it just makes it worse. Where's the food? <laughs> they walk around and go, <laughs> like, shut up. <laughs> yeah, that Sammy does that. <laughs> Sammy yeah. is terrible. And then she's got a new habit. Don't ever let your cat do this. She expects to drink out of faucets. Oh, yeah. No, my cats want to drink out of anything other than their bowl. Anything. Than the, there's a water bowl right there. And, they, and Sammy jumps up on the bathtub and says, sure. you know, you're going to turn it on? <laughs> they like the dog's bowl better than their bowl, so the They're dog so would be strange. drinking the water, and then one of the cats would just walk up next to it and start drinking what, next to it. What universe do cats live in? I don't think the it's the water's ours. moving around. They like moving water. Oh, they don't want still. Still's dangerous. Yeah. Hey, they're smart. That's right. Anyway, yeah. back to Microsoft. Uh, it's flushing. You know, it's just <laughs> entertainment for these things. Anyway. This this cat moment brought to you by Friskies. <laughs> okay, moving Yeah, on. I forgot what I was saying. But uh, the... <laughs> we were talking about AI and the next wave yeah, yeah, and the, how yeah, adeptly, right. adroitly, I think... Well... They've positioned themselves for this. They they you know, now admit that they they're know. putting I mean, in a massive investment into. Yeah, uh, I don't know if they got lucky or if AI. this is just whatever. But I I always sort of felt that Microsoft's cloud infrastructure would lead to opportunities of whatever kind. So um, whether you know we were talking about whether cloud computing was a wave or not. I mean, I I I think for a lot of people they think of cloud computing as like the back end, and, and maybe the web was the wave, maybe mobile apps were the wave, and the, you know the cloud is what's happening on the back end, but. Um, like we said last week, I think, you know, AI is going to transform every part of Microsoft. Bing, just Bing might actually become ascendant. Become something useful. Well, yeah. let's not get crazy, but yeah, you never know. <laughs> you never I'm know. sure Google's uh, worried about it. Google's for sure worried yep. about it. Oh, that's, and that's a big story. They are worried about it, right? They brought back their founders to have meetings and, you know, where should we put AI and should we push, for, you know, faster on stuff? They, uh, when they saw chat GTP, uh, GPT the first time, apparently they said, you know, where are we with stuff? And they weren't as far along as they wanted to be. And, you know, I, I think, uh, 
uh, the CEO of Google, um, his name is now Sundar Pichai. Sundar Pichai, thank you. Um, referred to it as a code red at Google, right? Yeah. This is, uh, Google gets this, this by the, the way, I just want to point out, Google has code reds regularly. Okay. Remember, okay. with well, social, all of a sudden they said, Facebook's going to kill us. Code red, code red. And they did Google Plus, and that didn't. You know, pay. yeah, well, I mean, so the Microsoft equivalent of that was the internet tidal wave, right? That was yeah. Microsoft's code red yeah. moments, right? Um, and uh, like you said, you know, it took them a little while, but they survived, they okay? They survived, <laughs> yeah. Uh, cloud um, was smart because cloud is so intimately connected with AI, uh, yeah. because you need the cloud, those you know, people use those, those uh, you know, special TPUs in, in yep. the cloud that are just oh, yeah, it requires enormous units. resources, yeah, yeah. Uh, they yeah. need big data bases. They need lots of storage. They need, right. and the and the problem with it, of course, is that you're doing the training. You need a lot of horsepower, but only then. And so it's not the kind of thing you want to invest in and buy and and put in your uh, on prem. You want to just use it, rent it uh, as you it, need it. it. Right. I, this is the inherent uh, promise in cloud computing. This everyone uses the example of holiday. Um, of holiday times at a retailer where all of a sudden you need a lot of infrastructure, but for the rest of the year, it's just sitting there idle and you're paying for it. Whereas uh, if you adopt a cloud computing um, solution, you can just turn, you know, turn we, it up when we, you need we it. We know this historically because uh, even Apple, you know, on the day the iPhone came out, their servers would crash. Yeah, Nobody, yeah, yeah. even the biggest companies can really handle those spikes. They don't want to have all that infrastructure right. in the off times. And cloud has come along and really and really saved that, really transformed that. So I'm not surprised. Cloud was the the big highlight of the quarter. Is that right? It was the saving grace of the quarter, <laughs> is the way I would put it. So Microsoft has three primary business units. Um, there was a period of time, and it was a long period of time, several years, where all three were roughly neck and neck. In fact, I, I seem to recall they're all between 11 and 13 billion in revenues per quarter for a long time. That was just the standard. Um, one of them is purely cloud-based. That's intelligent cloud. That's basically Azure and their legacy server products. Um, the other one is partially cloud-based. That's productivity and business processes. So that's Microsoft 365 minus uh, Windows and things like LinkedIn and Dynamics. And then there's the bucket they throw everything else into, basically, which is more personal computing. Uh, more personal computing used to be Microsoft, right? Like it's uh, Windows, their whole business, Surface now, yeah. and and Xbox. It's kind of their the things that don't fit in elsewhere, right? Right. Um, over time, more personal computing has been going down. Although during the pandemic, we did have a two year little asterisk where things were a little bit different, right? Um, but intelligent cloud, especially, has been going up, and productivity and business processes have been going up. So, I, I don't know the exact timing on this, but I would say for the past couple of years, uh, let's just simply maybe since the end of the pandemic. Um, intelligent cloud has been surging. Uh, productivity and business processes is kind of in the second biggest business, and more personal computing is their third biggest business, their smallest business. It's not a small business, but smallest business by revenue, right? So, intelligent cloud is uh, was in this quarter twenty one point five billion dollars in revenues, up eighteen percent year over year. These are the types of numbers we typically associate with Microsoft. Uh, if we just ignore the fact that we're in an economic downturn. Um, the other two businesses, uh, not so good. So productivity and business processes was $17 billion, which is still actually great, um, up single digit 7%. And then more personal computing was just, or was $14.2 in revenues. But that's down almost 20% year over year. And that's, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that specifically, because to me, that's the interesting stuff. Um, there is... There's some weird stuff going on, you know, like Mary Jo and I used to talk about this all the time. Microsoft likes to pull together, you know, they kind of cherry pick the best parts of the cloud businesses wherever they are and and present it as a thing. And this thing is called the Microsoft Cloud. It's not it's not a business unit. It's not a business. It's not anything. But the Microsoft Cloud, the idea there is here's something Microsoft can put out to Wall Street and say, see, we're doing pretty good against AWS, right? Um, $27.1 billion uh, credited to this non-business, which is up 22% over nothing. <laughs> uh, literally incredible, as <laughs> I put it. From zero um, to 22%. <laughs> well, it's whatever it was. It just doesn't, it's not, you're not comparing apples to apples for the most part here. So it's kind of a hard, it's kind of a goofy kind of a thing to say. However, I think that number is important, right? So 27.1 uh, is roughly half, right? Which is kind of where they want it to be. Uh, that's where it is historically. In fact, I think that's how they cherry pick it. Honestly, they want it to be about half, a little bit over half, I guess, in this case. 
um, of their total revenues. And and what they're trying to do here is present what Wall Street want wants to see. Like this is, you know, the, things are going great here. And if you look at their cloud oriented products and services, which I'm not going to do a lot because I just don't, I'm kind of more of a client side guy, but uh, that stuff is by and large grew, right? That, that stuff did well even during the downturn. And that's important because it kind of saved Microsoft's quarter. The problem is the rest of the stuff, with some small exceptions in the office space, uh, which actually did really well in con in commercial and not so hmm. well in consumer, hmm. um, the rest of it did really, really poorly. Like, <laughs> so, like Windows, not so good. Windows, really bad. Like really bad. Really? Um, and, yeah, really bad. But so they, but so they kind of give it away, though, don't they? Or, or Well, no. I mean, because, I guess they sell it to OEMs. Your yeah, there's PCs. two main revenue streams. So it's there, tied right? into new the, the the slump in new PC sales, I would guess. That's a big part of it. And then the other part is um, actually subscription revenues to um, commercial or to businesses, basically commercial meaning business, government, education. You know that that kind of part of the market. Um, yeah, because I guess we license Windows. We have some sort of enterprise. Yes, yeah. and that gives yeah. you different rights and, and support, and you can, if you want to, downgrade to Windows 10 and right. you know, all that kind of right. stuff. So you get all these different uh, capabilities there. So, that didn't do yeah. so good? No, and there's some warning signs here. So remember we had that conversation about the PC market, I don't know if it was a week or two ago, we were talking about PC sales for all of 2022. And they were PC sales overall last year only fell about 16%, using numbers from Gartner and IDC, and that doesn't sound too bad, right? But the problem is when you look at it quarter over quarter, you see it's accelerating, right? So first quarter of cal calendar quarter, uh, now we're talking 6% drop off, then 14% in the second quarter, then 17% in the third quarter, and then 28.3% in a holiday quarter. And I kind of made the case like, that's worse than it sounds because that's a holiday quarter. That's that should be a big one. Built, yeah. Uh, went to, oh, you know, should go up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this makes me wonder and worry about this quarter that we're in now and then subsequent quarters coming up. And Microsoft's data basically kind of confirms that. Microsoft's revenues to, uh, from PC makers, what they call OEMs, uh, was down almost 40% in the quarter. 40. <laughs> like, now, the reason that's a problem is Microsoft doesn't sell Windows licenses to PC makers for PCs that go out that quarter, usually. Those are sales for the future, right? In other words, PC makers buy these things in bulk or whatever, and then they have them sitting and they apply them to PCs when they go out the door. So some of those might have been from that quarter, but some of them are definitely from the coming quarter. And Microsoft actually kind of says that, right? So uh, remember, you know, one of the little asterisks is, you know, that uh, Gartner and IDC like to use is like, well, yeah, you know, PC sales are, are, are falling, but they're still above pre-pandemic levels. Right. Microsoft did not say that. Uh, no. what? <laughs> Microsoft okay. said instead that PC sales have now returned to pre-pandemic uh, levels. Interesting. And the question now, of course, is the question I've been asking all along, which is how far are they going down? Do they down? keep going down? Yeah. Right. They will. They will. Because They've got I to. think this 40% people, number. When people suggests, buy a lot, yeah. the yeah. market saturates. And then there's going to be a down period as, as people stop right. buying because they got all new stuff. Now, I'm gonna, we're going to talk a little bit later about some of the side issues related to this, because there is a concern with Microsoft where uh, with windows rather where Microsoft's like, we need to mon monetize this audience a little bit better. And it's tough when people aren't upgrading to new PCs. Right. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit, but Microsoft addressed that a little bit in the earnings. They would talk to, <laughs> this is so stupid. It's typical. Microsoft did get a lot of hard numbers, right? But they mentioned that, and this is not a hard number, this is a stupid number, but <laughs> usage intensity of windows <laughs> usage intensity. I know. <laughs> continues to be higher than pre-pandemic. Oh, we With... talk about cherry picking. I know, I know. So I would just call it usage. It no, but time. but it doesn't sound like usage. It's uh, there's a further qualifier. Like right, when so they're the, using it, they're leaning like they're, in. Like they're way of. more engaged. Like are you measuring the distance of their forehead to the webcam I think or something? It sounds. Do they say what it is? Because it sounds like like no. hours spent using Windows or something. I like literally that. wrote, I would love to know what this means. Yeah. I don't know. I, Usage I don't know intensity, that. please. So, but that speaks to the thing I just said. It, it, it's it's not a, that's not a great, that's not a very good metric for us because what this sort of means is Microsoft is seeing more and more people relying on PCs that they already have. They're not buying new PCs. How are they going to monetize They're using that? using them intensely. <laughs> They're going to have more ads and more, you know, we'll, we'll get to that. Oh, so there's, dear. Yeah. Yeah, there's that. There's it's, uh, it's the same number that Apple now reports instead of sales, which is uh, revenue, ARPU, aver, 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 average revenue per user. Yeah, and uh, 
That's yeah. a reasonable. I mean, it's not. A, it is revenue after um, all. Actually, that's an okay. Yeah, revenue. I'd love to see a revenue per user. But they don't <laughs> even do that. Windows. They just no. We'll it's always a that. bad sign when a company to me makes up a new stat right. <laughs> and says, "But we're really doing well in usage intensity." That's virtually yeah. an admission that they're not yeah. doing well in traditional stats. That's right. That's exactly right. And you know, when Microsoft started this back when uh, the Xbox One fell off the cliff. And they started talking about other metrics. They wouldn't. They like, we're not going to talk about console sales. Console sales is not where we make money anyway. That's fair. But these are these other metrics that we think are important. And to to that point you made about Apple, Microsoft will talk about uh, games per console. Mm -hmm. Like in other words, uh, mm -hmm. someone buys a console, how many games do they buy, or how many games do they buy in a year, or whatever that number is. And you want to see that go up every year. And you know, and they don't talk about that anymore either. By the way, so that's probably not going great either. Um, there's a lot of low bar numbers that don't really matter that are uh, soft numbers anyway. You know, usage of cloud-based versions of Windows, Windows 365 and Azure Virtual Desktop are <laughs> are growing. <laughs> it was literally the entire, well, of course it's growing. I mean, you know, one more person could use it last year and it grew, I guess. Like, there's no way to know what that even means. Um, you know, Windows 11 defer revenue deferrals, right? So when Windows 11 first shipped, they deferred revenues. That accounted for about four hundred twenty-six million dollars. It really wasn't a big deal. It was, uh, do, 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 yeah. So if if they didn't defer those revenues, the drop in revenues at more personal computing would have gone from thirty-nine percent down to thirty-six percent. So it still was going to fall through the floor. Like it, Windows Eleven didn't help. You know that kind of thing. Um, and then Microsoft specifically said that Windows OEM revenues, revenues from PC makers, will continue to decline this year as the PC market returns to pre-pandemic levels. So there you go. <laughs> and big numbers there. This, we get some hard numbers, right? Windows revenues from PC makers are expected to decline in this quarter in the mid thirties, meaning 35%-ish year over year, uh, minus 35%. That's terrible. And uh, Q3, Q3 for them is this quarter, right? Because their fiscal year goes from June, or sorry, from July to June. Um, PC sales, they said, this is for the wider market, are expected to be similar to pre-pandemic levels. So I think we can kind of give, you know, give up that little fantasy. Well, it's still above the, you know, pandemic, uh, uh, still above it was where it was at pre-pandemic. It's not, that's not how this year is going to go. So there's that, but that's okay. Cause Surface did even worse. And, and <laughs> this is the thing. This kind of kills me because you, you'll you remember that HoloLens had that 400 and something million dollar drop off because the Congress nixed the Army contract and Microsoft uh, basically said that they were going to realize that drop in the current quarter. And when the devices revenues were down 39 percent in the quarter, I figured they're going to talk HoloLens. They're going to say this is why they'll blame HoloLens. And that is literally not what they said. By the way, Microsoft didn't mention HoloLens once in any of their earnings documentation. It didn't come up once during the post-earnings conference call. They never mentioned I thought someone surely would ask about all ends. Nobody asked. So instead, the device's revenues were down 39% because of continued PC market weakness, which is Surface, and execution, cha execution challenges on new product launches. That's interesting. <laughs> That's another one I'd like to know more about. They mentioned that both in their... I think it was in their uh, PowerPoint presentation about the quarter. And then they mentioned it when they spoke during that post earnings conference call, where they again said that execution challenges impacted our surface business. So surface somehow tanked 39% in one quarter year over year. I think that's crazy. Wow. I, surface is, is not, it's, it's not a bad product lineup. You know, I, I certainly have my quibbles with some of the things that they do. I don't like how slowly they move. I really didn't like how slowly they embraced USB-C and Thunderbolt. Um, but when I look at their mix today and I look at what they have, I mean, there's a couple of things I would certainly criticize. But honestly, I think it's a pretty strong lineup. Um, I don't know. And by the way, it's going to get worse again. Yeah. Uh, the revenue declines for Surface in the current quarter are going to be in the mid-40s. And again... <laughs> It has to do with working through the challenges of that execution, well, working through the execution challenges that they noted earlier. Is, uh, do Lenovo, Dell, HP report the same kinds of drops, so, or is this unique to Microsoft? Have well, we, all we have right now to go on is the what the 
analysts have said. So we don't. Lenovo hasn't announced anything. Once they yet, give their um, quarterly results, which I am yeah, imagine but we can are coming. Actually, we can look at it. I mean, we can look at what those guys said, right? So let yeah. me see real quick. I'll look at it right now. Um, 39%. Yeah, it's big. So Lenovo, yeah, actually Lenovo, according to, again, Gartner and IDC, their sales fell 28% Okay. Uh, in the same quarter. HP uh, fell, oh, sorry, wait a minute. Is that the quarter of the year? Uh, that's got to be the quarter because it's so big. Um, HP, 29%. Dell, 37%. Oh, so this, <laughs> Apple, is, this is typical. Year over year, yeah. this is uh, yeah. this is what's happening. Okay. Yep. Yeah. This but again, is the, that is from pandemic highs. Uh, so. Yep. Well, it was well. Yeah, I don't know if last December was December it was a pandemic high, but yeah, I, it's it's um, well, suffice to say that, that yeah, the buying spree certainly continued. So yeah. It's, wow. It's not good. Uh, good thing they had the cloud. <laughs> exactly. Sa Satya Nadella is getting some pats on the back from the board. Wow, good yeah. move, good move, Satya. Uh, the only I, so you know, Xbox was down across the board. Gaming uh, generally was down across the board. Xbox hardware was down. Xbox, uh, Xbox software and services were down. Those were all in the low teens, twelve, thirteen percent, um, in line with expectations. In this case, uh, they said that Xbox Game Pass subscription grew, but didn't tell us by how much. Um, and they, like Sony, did say they expect increased uh, console supply uh, in this year, and so. Maybe that they will can be start selling them anyway. They can, yeah. Uh, do they say because uh, they don't they always in these analyst calls give a kind of forward looking statement? Do they say they expect a turnaround or is this more of the same? No, next every quarter? everything every one of these things that's down, they expect those things to all be down worse this in this quarter. Wow. Yeah. Every so this, one. I mean, honestly, uh, this has a lot to do with why these big tech companies are laying off so many people. And why yeah. Microsoft's doing the belt tightening? Uh, I thought it was kind of interesting that they laid off a lot of the uh, mixed reality folks. Yeah, well, probably. I think I have a little note about that later. But okay. Yes. It, no, but it, it's, it doesn't matter when we talk about it. But yeah, the you know, obviously Microsoft doesn't come out and say, "Hey, twenty six percent of the people we laid off were in this part of the bit." You know, they don't talk about that. But you hear from people, uh, people who write articles like I do, hear from people that they know, and you get like a sense of where these things are coming from. And overwhelmingly, there is a sense that they're getting rid of a lot of that part of the business. So there, there's kind of two sides to it. There's the hardware business, which is obviously the headsets, which they only make one first-party headset, and then they have partners that make the mixed relay headsets on the consumer side, which I don't know why anyone would do that. Uh, and then there's the software side. So uh, Well, they're talking about like the HTC Vive. And, uh, That's right. And I mean, the, it sounds uh, like what they sounds like, and somebody said this on MacBreak Weekly yesterday, it sounds like they're just going to let other people's headsets I, so I, I i wrote a an editorial before they had announced these layoffs where i said I, getting rid of holland seems weird to me but if they do this i think they still need to keep the software as a platform and offer yeah. it to third parties like they did with windows mixed reality right um there's a people forget about this and by people i mean me i forgot about this completely but there's something called alt space vr that microsoft bought a few years back right that entire team was killed, and that product's gone. I didn't even know it was a that thing. Was, so, no, people were. Uh, that was a place you would go into uh, yeah. and hang out with other people that didn't have legs. And so, <laughs> right, it was so. Uh, you know, I, you know, I don't want to say I told you so because it's early days yet, and VR may still be a thing. No, yet. I, I never, I, I just never. I don't know. I, I, I guess what I would say is I recognize the advances. Or the, the technology was incredible. They made really nice advances in HoloLens too. The price was always an issue. The fact that no major market emerged where this made a lot of sense. It was all a lot of small vertical markets. They obviously put all their eggs in that one basket with the U.S. Army. You don't have to be a, a, a military genius to fit and know anything about that, that much about HoloLens to realize this was probably not going to work. <laughs> you know, um, maybe not the best idea. And I think that with all the personnel, the loss to uh, especially to Meta. Um, and then Alex Kipman leaving kind of gutted that team. I, it's, I, I just feel like the whole thing is directionless and that the smaller, maybe smarter thing they can do going forward is to just keep working on the software and, uh, and do the interoperability stuff they're doing, right? They, they're working yeah. with Meta and others to get their software it's on. It's the same it's model as Windows, right? I mean, it was only recently, relatively, Microsoft yeah. made their own hardware for Windows. Um, I, I feel and look like how so well that's gone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, Too soon. I, 
Well, the interesting thing about the hardware from Microsoft's perspective, like I completely disagree with ever creating something called Surface. I don't think competing with your best partners, yeah. biggest partners, is a well, smart Well, now they're regretting ones. it, for sure. I, yeah. I think that was stupid. Yeah. But I think to in part to justify this uh, new model of way of doing things, this new, for them, new way of doing things, this kind of Apple-like way of doing things, that when they uh, started with HoloLens, I think the, the thinking was for us to get this thing going quickly, we'll just do it ourselves and we won't let these other guys get in the way. Although... You think HP especially would have tripped over itself to be the partner on that one because they follow Microsoft on every rabbit hole they've ever found. But that didn't work out either, right? I mean, Holland's, we've seen uh, two generations of delays, um, slow moving on all fronts. They had that one major rev with version two. Uh, then the Army thing happened. I just, it, it, this didn't work either, <laughs> you know? So um, I give them credit for going past that PC model because... That PC partnering model worked great for that one thing and didn't seem to work well elsewhere, like in media player software and other markets, you know, the uh, the home, what do you call it, the uh, media center stuff that they did. Um, it just never seemed to come together. Uh, maybe PCs are a unique market where, the, you know, for whatever reason, that just kind of makes sense for them. But they went they went it alone. And I, uh, yeah, it just didn't work out. So, yeah, I don't know. I, we should mention, I didn't mention this, uh, I mm -hmm. foolishly, that Richard's not here because he's on assignment at the Tower of London, where yes. uh, he is, in That's fact, right. polishing up the crown jewels for the coronation. Mm -hmm. uh, but he will be back next week. And we, he'll probably want to talk a little bit about cloud. So uh, we'll, that's kind of his bailiwick. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. I mean, I just hit it kind of at a high level. I mean, yeah. uh, it, it, if, it didn't exist. <laughs> you know, Microsoft might be talking of divesting itself of certain <laughs> products right now. Yeah, but yeah. Things have gone. What about uh, uh, the heat Microsoft got over having a Sting concert for its executives? <laughs> what? Oh, oh uh, this is fairly recent, right? Yeah, yeah. Davos, it was at Davos so. uh, yeah. the day before they announced the uh, big layoffs. They had a little, <sighs> little, little thing, a little will, intimate listen, show for the executives. Yeah. I always have a huge problem with this kind of thing. I'm not the right person to ask because this really, I, I, I would have referenced something like, you know, Satya Nadella flying on his personal jet over to Davos where, you know, destroying the environment as he lands and talking about the future as he's laying off 10,000 people. I mean, I, it's uh, it's a little unfair, you know, the way I just described it, but it's hey. also a little fair the way I just described <laughs> it's it. politics right? the way it's uh, played these days for sure. Well, I mean, it's true. Yeah. And I, how do you, I don't know. I it's don't appearances, know. I admit. It's more appearances than reality. But uh, I got to see Sting because of Microsoft. Sting played at, uh, I think it was the Windows XP. No, what was it? The, That's funny. It was the XP launch, yeah. They have a the thing York, for Sting. Yeah. yeah. I think every big tech company has its band. <laughs> I saw the Google Dolls, thanks to Microsoft. I also saw Dennis Miller, who he gave me my favorite Microsoft joke of all time. He said, what's with this Bill Gates guy? He's a monocle and a Cheshire cat away from being a Bond villain. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. biting the hand that feeds you. Good yep. for him. Yep. Wow. I thought that was it's good. a good line, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so, uh, look, things are looking a little grim at big, all around, uh, big tech. It's not, it's not unique yep. to Microsoft. Well, this is my, Microsoft, like I said, I think is the first, so, you know, we'll see. There were some, there were some okay points. You know, they finally gave a new number on Teams. Uh, Teams now has 280 million active users, which is great. That's the that first sounds like a lot. Number since I don't know what March, to compare it to. Is it? Well, you can compare it to Teams. So I think uh, the last oh, okay. number I think was 240. You know, uh, you know, nine months ago. So that's good. Um, the number of third-party apps is up in big ways. The number of active Teams rooms devices is up big time. Um, you know, people use our companies using uh, Teams phone to replace a traditional PT, uh, PSTN system is up by five million seats. Um, <laughs> by the way, I, I'll, I'll give you. I will give you a number to compare it to. Yeah. Um, Slack has its guest. The last okay. number we had was for 2020, which yep. was 18 million active users. Yeah, we're going to talk about Slack a lot. So, Slack, Slack, so that's coming up. That's a big difference. That's like yep. you know, yep, a, a order of magnitude plus. <laughs> so, we have we have antitrust stories to talk about. Oh, today. <laughs> so we'll, we're they're involved to there. Yeah, if you can't beat them, sue yeah. them. My favorite team's number, no, my favorite team's quote, rather, because it's not a number, is that we finally got the softball. Uh, Microsoft, this uh, just a few months ago, announced something called Teams Premium. Teams Premium 
is a way to take some of those features they gave away for free during the pandemic and charge you for them. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm just literally describing what it is. Um, Microsoft said, and I quote, there is strong interest in Teams Premium. <laughs> strong interest. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Whatever. Did they talk uh, at all about AI? Uh, at the, on yeah. The well, AI doesn't really impact uh, the revenues right now, right? But the, the, their introduction to Microsoft 365 as a product family, they said, I think it was Satya Nadella who said this, was that Microsoft 365 is rapidly evolving into an AI-first platform. And that makes sense, right? So uh, Microsoft 365 is their productivity tools and services, um, primarily Microsoft Office. And that's, I think, the one where, the one area where people can say, yeah, okay, like I get it. Like I could see how Word, Excel, PowerPoint, these legacy applications that have been around for 30 years-ish um, could be improved with AI. It's like not hard to see. So uh, that was it. That was the whole AI thing. Um, hmm. Although they hmm. made that, they announced that $10 billion. Yeah, they, they, they confirmed just that. Just ahead rumor. of the earnings. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I'm excited. I think... Uh, I, I'm glad to see that Microsoft is uh, on top of this one. It feels like they caught this Well, wave. you know, okay, so actually to go back to that for one moment, um, I, whether they were lucky or you know purposely positioned themselves, it's kind of hard to say. But back in the 1990s, there was this strategy that was all, it was all Windows, right? Windows 3.0 exploded. Windows 95 happened. It was the biggest product launch of all time for them. Um, it was all Windows. But they started, but, you know, Windows in particular, the Windows 9X versions of Windows, Windows 3, you know, were not well regarded in the industry for technical reasons, right? They, they were seen as kind of cobbled together products. It was a thing on a thing. It re, ran on top of DOS and all that. And that's why they hired David Cutler and that team from DEC to create Windows NT. It's why they hired people away from NetWare and Banyan and other companies to create their networking and workgroup products. And they kind of evolved Windows up into... Uh, what we now think of as managed environments, and then eventually into uh, the enterprise. And as they did so, they also created more technically sophisticated products. So NT was a, a whole level, you know, order of difference better than MS-DOS slash Windows. And uh, as we go forward into, you know, 2000 XP, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in the early 2000s, I mean, a big part of what Microsoft was talking about was that better together thing we mentioned last week, this notion that if you're a business of whatever size, obviously deploy Windows to your clients, but if you can put server on the back end, those things are going to be better together and you're going to get much more value out of that. You can have small business server. We have like Exchange and SQL and whatever else all running together on this one box. Um, you'll have Windows clients. Those things will work together. That will be great. It, it really was that work that set the stage for this AI stuff, right? Because it's that work that led into cloud computing. Um, and it was, that was an easy transition. You know, taking Microsoft server products, on-prem server products, and putting them in the cloud and giving users all those benefits and giving Microsoft the benefits. Well, they already had kind of had it in this on the server side, but we'll call them the subscription benefits of that uh, regular revenue, kind of a win-win for everybody. Um, they saw that as a great business model. It worked out for them. And Microsoft is a Windows only company, was very quickly a Windows office company and then a Windows office server company. And today, you know, they're, they're kind of cloud first. It's the server part of that business that evolved into this cloud computing thing, which is what makes AI possible, right? So, it re I mean, I don't, I'm not going to credit, I don't know who, who would get credit for that, I guess. Well, Bill Gates, right? I mean, did Bill Gates foresee this AI future? Not, not exactly, but I mean, but... Uh, but, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I think it's fair to Bill say... Bill would probably, probably say he saw it. I bet he would. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. No, I know it's going to happen. Yep, yep. Yeah, let me bring up a uh, slide for my mother. Um, <laughs> yeah, it says right here. AI. <laughs> yep. Yeah. 1993. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think probably Bill, after the debacle over the internet, was probably keeping his ear to the, the uh, rails. You know what, though? So I, we're going to talk about this later, too, but I, I was going over this part of their history very recently, and I got to say... Um, you know, Microsoft was slow uh, to, or Gates, Gates being the mind of Microsoft, right? The, the person who decided everything that they did was slow to understand the internet. This is the guy who published that book, remember, The Road Ahead? Yeah. Uh, it barely mentioned the web. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And everyone who reviewed it was like, did you hear, uh, have you ever heard of the internet? Thing, what is the web? This information yeah. highway thing you're talking about? Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, uh, but you know what, man, talk about turning a battleship on a dime. Yeah. Uh, within a year, uh, that, that company, everything was internet. 
everything. I mean, it was it, the the sheer number of products and services that they unleashed. You know, uh, they really you know, Netscape really did w uh, wake wake in a sleeping giant, as you said, <laughs> referencing you know uh, the the Japanese in World War Two. But um, but yeah, they they I mean, and I guess in the scope of things right now, I, the fact that they were maybe a year or two late to the internet maybe is less meaningful today. But at the time, it seemed like the stupidest mistake of all time. Um, but then you go forward a couple of years. Yeah, and, I, mean, I mean, yeah, they missed a year or two. But. I think IE surpassed Netscape usage share within, I want to say it was less than two years. I think yeah. it was something like that. It was very quick. Yeah, it was in 94 and 95. I mean, it was, it didn't take long. Yeah. They they jumped quick. right on that thing. Yeah. Yep. I mean, they made mistakes later that screwed that up, but whatever. I mean, they, they did, you know, .NET, can't, whatever. <laughs> it's a, it's a we'll business school case study kind of a Oh, it sure is. Thing. Let me, I want to um, talk about, read to you mm -hmm. and get your opinion on what, what Ben wrote on uh, Stritch okay. Hickory. You're familiar with uh, Ben Thompson, oh, yeah. I'm sure. Yep. Uh, he's, you know, he, he he's, he's, great. he's a good analyst. He's done quite well um, mm -hmm. uh, with his newsletter and his podcast and so forth. We used to have him on until he got real big time. He wrote, <laughs> he wrote, sure. he wrote a piece uh, on, and this is for subscribers only. I think I subscribed AI and the Big Five, and he. This is where he talks, as I mentioned, about the the ep, the epochs, uh, the yeah. PC, the internet, cloud computing, mobile, and how the right. next one is going to be AI. And he he says, I thought this was really interesting. Microsoft, meanwhile, seems to be the best place of all. Yep. It has a cloud service that sells GPU. It's the exclusive cloud provider for open AI. Yeah, it costs them a lot of money, but it gives you an inside track. Right. Bing, meanwhile, is like the Mac on the eve of the iPhone. <laughs> this is interesting. It contributes yeah. a fair bit of revenue, but a fraction of the dominant player. Right. Uh, but if incorporating chat GPT risks, uh, results into Bing risks a business model for the opportunity to gain massive share, it's a bet well worth making. As you mentioned, productivity you know, apps are going to get it. Uh, they put Copilot, right. which is based on GPT, into mm -hmm. GitHub with, I, th I, despite the controversy, I think some real success. Right. And then he says, what's important is that adding on new f functionality, perhaps for a fee, fits perfectly with Microsoft's subscription business model. So they were, yeah. you know, uh, people didn't like it, but Microsoft didn't want this pay once perpetual you know, licensing no. thing. People... And Go ahead. I don't know what to say to that. So Microsoft has been using a subscription license program for business users for 20 years. Right. This is actually not new. The, the other, I don't know if he says this. But it not, was but a I, kind I, of a gradual, you know, he's, well, it took office a while to get to that point, but they did. It, it, okay. Fair enough. I, I, I uh, yes. It you, was clear. I mean, look, we were talking about this 20, 15 years ago that there was yeah. clearly was Microsoft's intent despite consumers you know, a well, version to the subscription to, right. model, right? Well, it's, that's, that's the thing I was going to kind of, that's an interesting discussion. Business doesn't because mind, I guess, huh? I don't think consumers mind too much either. As it's it just that out. they're selective about what they pay. Because right. think about, seriously, uh, it's it's still January. This is the right time of year to go into Mint or whatever you're using and look at all your stupid subscriptions and be like, what am I doing? Like, it's astonishing how many things we pay for on a monthly or I know. basis. We may not like right? it, but we've given in. We've we've Well, it used to be about big purchases, right? Yeah. This was the only way you could afford to buy a car or a right. house. Buy now, pay now later. It's, or, now yeah. it's you could you could spend you could go to Amazon and buy like a twenty nine dollar cable and it'll say, Do you want to split it over three payments? Yeah. I, I mean it's it's you could you can do this with everything now and we do do it with everything. Yeah. How many um people listening to the show right now, how many people pay for five or more uh, video streaming services oh, every yeah. month. Oh yeah, right. Oh, In yeah. addition to probably cable or some cable right. equivalent like YouTube Absolutely. TV. You almost have I to mean, if you want to watch the things you want to watch. Yeah, so I don't think I, we. I think we've gone kicking and screaming, but we've gone. Is the point? We're we're doing it. I, well, but I, for this to work, there has to be a real world advantage to it. So, for example, if I wanted to watch um, movies back in the day, right. I could buy them at great expense. Remember, like, what, what was it like to buy like Star Wars in 1985 on VHS? It was probably like 120 <laughs> bucks, right? Yeah, yeah that's or, true. I think you could rent a movie from a rental place or whatever. You could buy music on CD or album or whatever you're using at the time. You could buy music on, say, or just music. I'm sorry. You could buy, uh, 
you know, whatever the content is, a book. You know, you could buy a book and say, like, a book is in in hardcover, it's twenty nine dollars. I could wait till it comes up in paperback, but that's like nine months from now, and now it's going to be like five dollars or whatever. We have all these models, but then you move forward to this new system, the subscription system. It's like I can have all the music the world's ever created for nine ninety nine or increasingly, maybe twelve ninety nine a month or whatever it is. I have Netflix and Hulu and Disney and whatever else, HBO Plus, uh, Max. And it's they're, they're nine to twenty bucks a month each, and blah blah blah. But I have this incredible library of whatever. I could buy all those Star Wars movies on Blu-ray right now, or I could just subscribe to Disney Plus and watch them in four K at any time. You know that kind of thing. So it, I, the the value the value has to be there for people to say okay. Sometimes the value is so good they say okay to so many things they get a little bit of fatigue to it. Um, I think the problem with the office stuff, for example, just to use a Microsoft example, is you don't see like big numbers on office consumer subscribers. In fact, I have the exact number. I think it's 40 something. Nope, 63 million, 63.2 million people subscribe to uh, Microsoft 365 family or personal compared to the 1.5 billion people that use office every single day. Wow. That seems like a really small number. Right. And I think part of the problem is they perceive it as being something that you get with a PC for free. Right, and you use it for the duration of that PC, yeah. and now you're telling me I have to pay ninety nine dollars yeah. a year for this no, thing. I, you know. I've talked to people, but people are coming right? along and they go eight bucks a month. It takes a while. It takes so, you know eighty dollars a but, year. I can afford but, that. This is why AI is so exciting, right? So Microsoft's are, so there's a couple of things I would say. The real world advantage to having a Microsoft three sixty five subscription to basically anyone today is you get a terabyte of storage on OneDrive, and that's huge. I I, I think a lot of people, well, sixty three million people will say, yeah, okay, yep. I, I may I may not need it all, but I can put my photos there. I can put videos there if I want. I can put my whatever I have. I can put everything there. Um, okay, cool. And that's good. You know, and you get access to all those apps you're going to have anyway. And you get there are services that are only online, and you get adfreeoutlook.com or whatever. And that's cool. I, I th Microsoft would have or has been advertising it like, hey, you get all these new features too, right? Um, if you buy Office uh, 2019 or now we have Office 2022, I think. Uh, you buy this thing, you can only put it on one computer. You can put this other thing on as many computers as you want. You can use it on 10 computers at a time per user. And every month there's going to be new features. And you're like, yeah, I, I'm i using Microsoft Word, buddy. I don't really, uh, new features are not a problem for me. In fact, I would say for me, literally for me, I, as I, I am a professional writer, I don't need any new features in Word. In fact, I need fewer features. I don't care about new features. However, the this the advent of this AI thing, I think it's going to be the selling point where they can say, because they're not going to put this in the the version you buy for your computer. They're going to put it in the version you get with subscription. If you want to use the AI enhancements that are coming from chat GPT or whatever other open AI technologies, that's where that's going to be. And I think we'll see. Like, I don't know when we're going to hear about this. We Obviously, we have uh, builds coming up probably in May. Uh, we will have a, uh, an Ignite show in the end of the year, November, probably. You know, who knows when the what the timing is, but those advances, because this stuff has been so heavily publicized, people have seen all those beautiful painting-like photos you can make with it of your face or uh, the, the paintings that they're making when you describe something to it or the, the writing that it does for you. We can describe a story or whatever. Um, it's, this is coming to Microsoft 365. That might actually trigger some growth there, right? That might be the thing that pushes it over the top. So it's a possibility. I compare it to... Um Adobe. I mean, people still push back really hard on the yep. on the subscriptions at Adobe. I guess because it's not cheap. Although it's these are professional really, tools. Adobe, I know, but geez, Louise, like I buy, um, I use Photoshop and I use Premiere, but I don't use the CC apps. I use the Elements versions because I can buy them once every two or three years. Right. Those things don't change a lot. Right. There are a couple little things that aren't great. Like I can't pull in like a WebP. Or, uh, There's not a big like difference. Yeah, I completely forgot about Elements. So that's yeah, not, they're, they're, honestly, I just do yeah, that. Huh. I'm just saying, I, they're so much less expensive. They're often on sale. You can get both for like eighty to ninety dollars. Right. And they don't have Lightroom elements, unfortunately. I no, wish they, they do. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, yeah, it's not everything, but yeah. I, I, I can't believe I, I am. I've never understood how expensive the Adobe services are. Um, well, and, and it's people kind of have gone in the opposite direction. People have uh, found inexpensive alternatives, and you know, like Affinity, and use them. Oh and, my God! And yeah, I, yeah, and yeah. Those, those things yeah. work great. I think it's yep. hurt Adobe. Let me give you the last sentence uh, from uh, Ben Thompson because you'll like it. Uh, okay. It's notable that the company 
once thought of as a poster child for <laughs> victims of disruption, will, in the full recounting, not just oh. be born of disruption, but be well placed to reach greater heights. Because well, of I would have said reborn of disruption. Yeah, he's yes. really given yeah. them a lot of credit for having uh, caught this. Well, because new wave. they literally are, as he says, he's correct. Uh, of all of these companies, they are the best position to take advantage of it. It doesn't mean they're going to win, right? right? I mean, uh, you know, we'll see. Uh, Google, like, you know, has done their little code red thing. I'm sure Amazon's working on whatever as well. And Apple, uh, you know, Apple is a unique company in this space uh, because they don't tend to do things that are kind of cloud forward. It, it, a lot of their stuff is the on-device advances that they do, but they have such a large audience. Those things are really impactful. Um, it's in, it's like interesting. A, I think that they may be left out a little bit, although he actually is pretty bullish on their on their prospects. Well, I, this is where their App Store thing is going to save them because yeah. it's, it, there'll be apps that run on this stuff that use this on the back end. And, yeah. and it, it, this is like the, we use this, we talked about this with cars. You know, you're not going to see a Microsoft logo in a car. Yeah. Um, but their stuff might be on the back end. Um, you might not realize you're running open AI yeah. or chat GPT, but you're doing right. it on your iPhone. You don't right. care. You have the fun app. Right. You know, so right. it's a win-win. Yep. So uh, while uh, this quarter was disastrous, uh, especially well, for hardware. Expected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's still a, fright, a fright future for Microsoft. A bright future. A fright future. <laughs> a fright future um, for Microsoft. It depends on the business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that they have, well, let's put it this way. They seem to have uh, strategized for the future well. And uh, I, a lot of credit to uh, Satya Nadella for that. Let's take a little break, yeah. uh, come back with more again. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard's not here. He'll be back next week. Uh, but don't worry, we have a brown liquor pick nonetheless, thanks to Mr. Oh, Thurot. I'm going to go grab that right now. Go get, your, go get your brown yeah. liquor yep. uh, right. while I talk about our sponsor, our studio sponsor's ACI Learning, these guys uh, are great. You may not know the name, but I know you know IT Pro. They bring you engaging and entertaining IT training. We've talked about them for years. Now IT Pro is part of ACI Learning. Together, IT Pro and ACI Learning are expanding their production capabilities. That's what's exciting about this partnership. It's going to be even better. Bringing you the content, the learning style you need, you love, but at any stage of your development and in a number of new arenas, whether you want individual training for yourself or you want to train your whole team, whether you're interested in IT or audit, they have Audit Pro. Uh, if you're interested in cybersecurity, these capabilities, these, these uh, offerings have now become richer and broader. And of course, they've got the practice labs, the hubs where you can actually go in if you're one of those people who likes a... a, a personal experience one of the most widely recognized uh, oh I, before i say that let me just mention because i this number i love we've been talking about it pro for years on the show since they started uh together with aci learning now there are two hundred twenty-seven thousand active members in the it pro learning community Two hundred twenty-seven thousand. many of them are, are our listeners we think that's so great now the content number has gone up, 6,800 hours of content, new content added daily in every area, uh, CompTIA, Microsoft IT training, Cisco, Linux, Apple, security, they're really big on security, cloud, of course, one of the most widely recognized beginner certificates, many of you maybe when you got started in IT got the A-plus certificate from CompTIA. CompTIA courses from IT Pro and ACI Learning make it easy to level up your employees, especially those who are uh, interested in cybersecurity. You know, if you have an IT team, it really is to your advantage to get them up to speed on the latest security certs. The most popular certs offered by ACI Learning include CISSP, AWS, Cloud, of course, ISACA, CCNA, other in-demand tech skills and certs include technical support specialist, computer user support specialist, information security analyst, and a lot more. Now, certs really are, of course, a way of showing that you know that you have the skills, but it's also a great way to show your customers that you're committed to keeping your organization up to date, your stakeholders. Yes, you see, we, we care about training. We and, and you know what? Your employees... Love the opportunity to learn. And with ACI Learning and IT Pro, they love what they're getting. 
With IT Pro's business plan, ACI Learning offers fully customizable training for your team. Their dashboard, we've talked about it before, is fantastic. It lets you track individual results, team results, manage seats, assign and unassigned team members. Uh, you'll get monthly usage reports. You can see metrics like logins and viewing time, tracks completed, and more. Um, assignments can be full courses or individual episodes. And because all the courses have full transcripts, it's easy to find a, what you need and say, you know, Joe, you got to, I want you to take this course or this particular lesson in this course because I need you to know about how to secure, you know, the uh, whatever it is, there are OAuth endpoints, that kind of thing. You get full access to advanced reporting, including, by the way, very visual reports, which is great for showing the, the board, the C-level executives, your customers, what you're up to. Viewing patterns, progress over time, all of that. So they know they're getting a good return on investment. So many respected companies and government agencies around the world turn to IT Pro and ACI Learning year after year to help them maintain their competitive edge. Supporting organizations, not just across IT, but across audit and cybersecurity readiness. ACI Learning. ACI Learning. Get, get to know that new name. Keeps you and your team uh, at the top of your game. And that's good for everyone. From entry-level training to putting people on the moon, ACI Learning has you covered. Maintain your company's competitive edge with ACI Learning. Here's the website. Go.acilearning.com slash twit. That's go.acilearning.com slash twit. If you're looking to start today with a standard or premium individual IT Pro membership, We've got that great discount, twit30, twit30, you'll get 30% off. Go.acilearning.com slash twit. We're really thrilled to have uh, IT Pro and ACI Learning as part of our family and, and as supporters who sponsor our studios. And uh, it's, a, it's a great partnership with a, with a really great company. ACI Learning, go.acilearning.com slash twit. All right, Paul's got a slug of liquor, so uh, we're ready to uh, move <laughs> move on. Continue. Listen, if I'm going to get through the second part of this show. Oh, my God. So, uh, <laughs> here she comes. <laughs> oh, boy. Kitty, here comes Kitty. Can you hear my cat? No. Oh, wait cheese. a minute. A little bit in the background, I can now. Yeah. Get, 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 get. Uh. Yeah, come by my feet so I can kick you. <laughs> no, Paul, even <laughs> in jest. Even in jest. Uh, no, so, no. you said something that kind of. Um, mm -hmm. It's not something you've not said before, but it worries me a little bit that the future of oh. Windows is advertising. Yeah. Well, this is the, uh, yeah, so we kind of alluded to this notion that Microsoft has this audience of a billion, maybe 1.5 billion, whatever the number is, people using Windows, but they're not really upgrading, right? And Microsoft doesn't offer those upgrades. Windows 10 and 11 were free updates, right? Um, and you can go to a store and buy it in a box or whatever. But, I mean, this is not how Windows is sold. People buy a new computer, they get Windows. That's the thing. I just had a friend today uh, just text me and say, hey, uh, I just got offered Windows 11. This is something I want on my computer. And that's a whole conversation. <laughs> the perennial you know? question. <laughs> Never well, gets old. You know, hey, it, there were worse questions. I remember another friend when we got, when Windows 8 came out got a new PC. And he said, so how do I put Windows 7 on this <laughs> yeah, thing? How do I get <laughs> I rid like, of oh. this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's not good. Um, so yes, but any so here you know this is big audience. Microsoft wants to move to the subscription model across the board, like we've been talking. Um, we as Windows users have feared this notion of a uh, Windows three sixty five thing. Although now they're using that name for a different product, but the idea was like you know Microsoft will charge us to use Windows somehow every month or every year or whatever. And I think you know Microsoft understands this is not going to fly. This isn't McAfee, <laughs> you know. Um, it's not going to work. Um, so how? what else could you do? And I think we have to respect the notion that Microsoft has a right to try to monetize its customers as much as it can, right? And we have a hope as those customers that they'll do so in ways that are maybe not annoying. But, um, <laughs> you know, starting with Windows 8 and then moving up through 10 and now 11, um, advertising keeps getting worse and worse. Um, and advertising takes many forms. Obviously, there are, you know, suggestions or literal ads sometimes little yellow bars that appear at the top. Hey, did you know? Um, there are uh, sponsored uh, app shortcuts in your start menu for things like, uh, you know, Spotify and Messenger and whatever else, right, that are not actually installed, but you click on them, they install, and, and someone is paying Microsoft to put that stuff in there. It's a, it's a sponsorship thing. 
Um, but there's there's other stuff going on. You know, I was I was kind of I was looking at because I've been writing the book, right? You start running these apps you don't normally run. There is a premium edition subscription for solitaire and casual games, which is the new name of this app that costs two dollars per month or fifteen dollars per year. So you don't have ads, huh? There's a ClipChamp essential subscription that we kind of know about, right? It's just twelve bucks a month, which is expensive, um, but still can't export to four K. Obviously, the Xbox app. If you want to use that thing effectively, you need a Game Pass subscription. That's ten to fifteen dollars a month, depending on the tier. Use OneDrive. You want to get extra storage, you can pay for that. You can get a Microsoft three hundred and sixty five subscription. Then you can pay for it again if you want to, because they have that additional subscription, right? There's there's all this kind of additional stuff, um, and. Like I said, it's it's understandable, and we and you were there, so you'll remember this. I we had this conversation with Chris Capasella a little bit over a year ago, where I said, "Well, look, why don't you offer a way for people to pay not to have this crap huh. in Windows?" Yeah, what did he say? And I forgot. His pushback was that that wouldn't be a good uh, value proposition for Microsoft because it would be implicitly admitting admitting they were stuff <laughs> didn't, didn't add value. <laughs> they were crapping up Windows. <laughs> So here's my here's my retort. Did he actually that. say that out loud? Yeah, Wait, that's yeah, great. Another, this is well, why I like Chris. The way he said it was, he goes, "We can't offer that because that would be like us admitting that those things were bad. We believe yeah. that those things, yeah, you know, were good or whatever." Right. And uh, I love you know, you, you listen. You gotta love this guy. You gotta love his clarity. You gotta love his transparency and all that kind of stuff. But the thing is, Microsoft actually does offer a product that does this almost exact thing. It's called Ad Free Outlook, right? <laughs> It's a perk of Microsoft 365. It's um, It takes away the ads from the Outlook.com web experience, right? So I, I suppose in a way you're admitting they're bad, those things are bad. I mean, I have a premium subscription on my website that I would say that, well, there's two key components to it. But one of the big deals is it takes away the ads because ads on the web are terrible today. And it's not our fault. It's just the way the, the you know, the world is. But anyway, um, I, not everyone is going to pay for this thing. And, and there is this kind of, I want to call it egalitarian <laughs> viewpoint or something where it's like everyone should be able to have, you know, an ad-free experience, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But the reality is life is full of these kinds of things. I, I think I used the example of um, like a, a first-class airplane ticket and you're in coach in the back and they, they pull over that crap, you know, this terrible little transparent curtain thing is... Like a you know like enjoy it enjoy it in the back of the bus. I hope the chickens don't you know get in the way. Um, th that's you know uh, cars luxury cars had uh, safety features first things like yeah, actually seatbelts, but also like airbags and different kinds of airbags like on the side all kind of thing. I mean, unfortunately, this is the world that we live in. And and I, as I uh, as, that, as a member of the one uh, percent, I yeah, appreciate exactly exactly love that. I mean. Well, I, we just okay. So we just talked about Adobe and how that was expensive. And so for me, that's kind of where I draw the line. I'm like, I, I do use these products. I, I, I guess I technically use Photoshop just about. I, do, I use it every day. Uh, I don't use it as much as Word, you know, of course, or a web browser, but I use it. But whatever the, I don't remember the prices for the CC or just for. Once you once you subscribe to two of those products, it makes sense to get the full boat thing. I, I, is it the way I recall it? Um, they're very expensive, but whatever the price is, I, that's where I draw the line. And for something like Microsoft 365 family, where it's a hundred bucks a year and literally everyone in my family uses it, that to me makes tons of sense. I, I think, think it's fair to say. I think part of the problem. Yep. It used to cost a lot to do this stuff. Yeah. That, well, actually that was my, that was my concern about Adobe because people forget this. Microsoft Office as a product it used to be eight hundred like seven eight hundred bucks. Yeah, yep. And it so used that's to a down. PC used to the PC you wanted was always twenty five hundred dollars. That's right. That's right. Uh, we were talking about the lease. It's the fortieth anniversary. Ten thousand dollars. That's right. Uh, this stuff used to be expensive. Ten, by the way, that's ten thousand dollars in nineteen eighty dollars. Yeah, real money. That money today would be twenty five yeah. thirty, whatever the number is. I mean. I remember yes. getting a deck uh, PC, very nice PC. It was a you know a ten grand. Was it a rainbow? No, it was a, it was no. a, you know, I don't know, maybe it was a 486. I think it was. Oh, I'm sorry, deck, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry. digital yeah, equipment PC, when they were yeah. still making uh, personal computers, yep. mm -hmm. uh, and it was very, it was. I looked at it, I went, this thing is like tens of thousands of dollars. Right. That's how it was, and then there's been this push to the bottom to, and and it really comes from a desire from companies to commoditize uh, the stuff you use on your computer. 
mm -hmm. to boost the sales of the computer itself. But there's been a downside to that because what's also oh. gotten commoditized is the computer. And so now everything's right, cheap. And we, but you actually, know, we are really getting a good deal when you're getting office for $8 a month. But you're getting, but that's the point. It is $8 a month. So if you think, if, if, let's say you spent $800 in office, right? And you were like, well, I would, how much would it be? How many months would I have to use this thing for it to get down to $8 a month? A hundred months. Well, how many months is a hundred months? I mean, how many years is that? You know, eight years or something like that? Yeah, it's a long time. That probably is the length of time that a lot of people are using these things. So it, uh, the it's other the same the cost. Other, I mean, Microsoft, I'm sure, wants it to be but that's ultimately the things, same. Right. right. Listen, I, I, I don't, most people don't have $800 to spend on something like that, right? But they do have $8 this month, and they figure they'll have $8, $8 next month. And that's why these subscription services make sense to individuals, right? Because they allow you to buy something. You know, back in the day, like I, I, I worked in a bank. I was a teller, and I remember this woman came in. She was so, I used to see her all the time. She cashed her check. She worked in the mall. And she was so happy. She was, so, she was getting a cashier's check. It was, this is 1988-ish or 89 or something. So it might have been as much as, you know, $12,000 or something at the time. Whatever it was. To me, it was a lot of money. And I'm like, what are you doing? And you, you're getting, I'm like, $12,000? What are you doing? And she says, I'm buying a car. And she saved up for it month to month. She put some money aside every month until she had enough money. That woman uh, is an exception. <laughs> That is not the way the world works, at least not our world, our country. People buy things they can't afford, and they, they push them off, and they or they pay for them piecemeal, and that's, that's, that's very common. I mean, it's the way it is. So, yeah, I, I, Adobe software, Microsoft software, it was a lot more expensive. You, you, you can Hopefully, they're making a case for the value that you get. But for, for Microsoft or Adobe, getting $8 a month forever is way better than getting $800 once and then eight years goes by and then maybe maybe you get $800 again. Like it's it's better for accounting, it's better it's just better for it's better across the board. Um I don't I, I don't know. It, it's tough because in technology we do expect things to cost less. Um but I think the way we expected this stuff to cost less was that instead of spending $800 every eight years in office, I would spend eight dollars <laughs> once on office and then buy it again in eight years or something like or maybe that's an exaggeration but um i mean a, a typical retail price for like a standalone copy of office is probably a hundred bucks ish or something i know they have special deals online it's probably as cheap as thirty dollars you can buy it for one computer it's probably hard or maybe even impossible these days to move that license to a different computer it's kind of a different situation but you know what for a lot of people they only have one computer they don't care most people don't have the stupid collection of computers that I, you know, that I'm surrounded by every day. Um, in my case, being able to move my Microsoft 365 subscription around is huge. Um, and like I said, I'm using it for my whole family. So the, the value of that is just, it's off the charts. But this is math we all have to do. I mean, it's, it, and it, you know, it's a case by case basis. But like I said, Adobe, that's where I'm like, yeah, no, <laughs> I'm not paying for that. That's too much. It's too much. It, it's too much for the way I use the product for me. Yeah. You know, but I, you know, uh, I guess my point was, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did I go far? far I feel bad for you. I'm so sorry. Yeah. No, yeah. I, yeah. no, my point was though, these companies do have to make, be profitable. Yes. And, uh, so how would you do it? You're Microsoft. You got this Windows product, right? This thing is bringing in pretty good money still, even in an off month. It's still or an off quarter. But you know, you, you, you're like, we have this audience. It's a big audience. Yeah. And if and, and I'm sure they have some vague idea. Apple makes X amount of dollars per quarter on each iPhone customer. Uh, Google makes X amount of dollars on each, you know, Android, whatever it is. And they're like, man, we are really lagging behind. And I I, I think part of it is just the nature of the the legacy nature of the product and our expectations and all that kind of stuff. But it, like I said, it's, it's understandable that they would want to drive more revenues. Unfortunately, they do all the underhanded stuff. They do the stuff where you're like, I have chosen Chrome as my default browser, but when I click on a search highlight, it loads uh, edge and it loads a Microsoft website and it loads Microsoft advertising on the back end. And that's one of the ways that they monetize you as a windows user. It's underhanded. It's, you're giving uh, the user an unexpected and unwelcome experience, which is not is you're you're not respecting the choice that they made, or you're showing advertising or suggestions or sponsored apps. 
uh, that you didn't. Right now, we're, this is probably a mistake. Microsoft has not commented on this, but when you install, or rather when uh, Microsoft Edge upgrades to a new version, which it does, you know, every four weeks, an Edge icon appears on your desktop now. I deleted that icon. Why is it reappearing? I delete it, it comes back. I delete it, it comes back. It's like we're playing a little game with Microsoft. It's like, how, how much can they push us before we finally say, you know, Linux is a thing, right? I could buy a Mac. <laughs> like, what what are you doing? Well, that's, um, yeah, I mean, that's the risk, of course. Right. Um, uh, to be fair, I put Linux on almost every PC I buy after a while because I just, uh, you know. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Starts to drive me crazy. You lisp running <laughs> madman. Actually, yeah. you know well, what? Uh, <laughs> WSL probably yeah. will start yeah. changing that. It's, it, it did already with Chromebooks, where if I can run, if I can just mm -hmm. run Emacs <laughs> and a few programs yeah, like that, makes up for a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. Then I'm then I'm. This like, is the use exact it. opposite of the way most people think. By the way, um, you know, like if you if I were to go go to a Chromebook or a Linux box, I would say. If I could just run OneDrive, if I could just run <laughs> Microsoft Word, if I could just run, you know, it's like those kinds of things. Uh, um, it's interesting that your workloads are such that they're uh, like Linux apps, <laughs> you know, which I think is a very developer centric way of um, uh, yeah. doing things, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, it. I also feel like there is, I and I'm, uh, I apologize for this because I'm still a hippie. But I really love uh, open, non-proprietary yep. stuff where uh, yeah. you're not the product, you know. And um, uh, well, there are a newsflash for you though, because you, a, you're right, and it doesn't really have anything to do with any kind of like '60s ideal or whatever you want to call it. Um, Microsoft agrees it's right too, because everything new that Microsoft's doing, yeah, not everything, but a lot of uh, non-proprietary stuff. All the developers, yeah, yeah there, there's a lot of open source, yeah. a lot of open source. They just completed a several-year project to. Um, uh, completely open source the entire .NET stack. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, .NET, .NET was the last major Microsoft platform 22 years ago-ish. It was completely proprietary. Well, I'm going to call it 99.9% .9 because there was a little escape hatch there, but it was, it was, a, it was for Windows. That's what yeah. it was for. .NET was going to run on Windows. It was going to run on Windows Server and, uh, and Windows Mobile and, you know, whatever. But, um, yeah, Microsoft has seen the light. I mean, it's, I don't know. I, I think we're too far along with some things. Like, I don't know, you know, Windows, probably not ever going to be open sourced. Um, Office, you know, whatever. But, but a lot of this new stuff, and even when it's not, even when it's proprietary. Their um, core like stuff, Microsoft though, Teams, is never going to be open. Their core, well, but, their money-making stuff, they yeah, can't you know make it open. But they can use open technologies to create it, and that's what they've been doing. Yeah, and that's the thing. I, I, you well, know, that's open but see, source. This is maybe I'm cynical, but I, this is what mm -hmm. I feel is that they are uh, using these open technologies uh, because yeah. they support their core business, mm -hmm. and so they're going to have you know whether it's Azure or Windows, they're going to have a, a profit making. They have to. They're they're. A profit making well, yeah, yeah, no, they have to make money. A but, profit but making core business. Red Hat and has somewhat, to make money. I mean, yeah, you know. But somewhat um, cynically, uh, and uh, again, I'm going to have to quote Ben Thompson, who was actually <laughs> quoting uh, quote Clayton yeah. Christensen uh, from the Innovators okay. Dilemma, that yeah. companies will commoditize all the stuff around them. Apple wants apps to be cheap because it supports their, right. their money making product, the iPhone. Uh, Microsoft wants tools to be free well, because okay. it supports so, their money making product okay, windows I, I i again i i don't mean to hold up microsoft well i will say that microsoft in this regard is a better company than apple um apple was a company when they started doing os 10 talked about its open source they, they were all open source and they did that stuff's dropped it's gone well darwin's still um, there and they still contribute but, back to it there's no there's still a core not a, okay all right but i don't know what anyone's doing with darwin i mean like but the but when Microsoft uses open technologies to create something like Microsoft Teams, for example, what they're really doing is creating a world in which it's much easier for developers to extend that product with their own solutions. And this is maybe the modern version of that partner ecosystem we were talking about with PC makers, where the relationship has changed a lot. Um, look, they are still look. They're uh, at their heart. They still have proprietary software, 
yeah. Know, I mean, they look. Uh, we these whatever. companies um, all are profit making businesses. We that's yep. they're how they're constituted. They're never going to be. And even just, Red Hat, I, I if feel, IBM okay, bought but, it to support their core money making consultancy businesses, you know that's where they make their money. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I don't know that we'll ever see an example of a company of Microsoft size announcing when no. they hit look we're going completely over. like no, I just don't know that won't. that's possible. No. Yeah. Um, but, but they I like open like source to the degree it supports their profit making businesses. Uh, they get that a lot of free. That is right. You are yeah. actually a hippie. That is very. I simple. am a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. I no, warned it's true. You. no, 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 no. It's true, but it's true. You know, you're right. I mean, it's true. Of course, it's true. Um, so they're always going to. That's. I guess what I'm saying is, um, I feel like though that open source has to coexist. And um, yeah, it's like the frog in the scorpion. It's not Star Trek, right? We don't. We're not giving up money. We're not. <laughs> you know, it's not this like. No, 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 no. We're not headed future. into this utopia. No, you know, no, like no, that's no. not. Uh, We're yeah. a capitalist society. Yeah. I, the, it's the frog and the scorpion. This it micro, It's in Microsoft's yeah. nature, and <laughs> wow, they're always going to bite the frog in the long run. You just, you know, it's the way it wow. is. Wow, it's, it's in my nature. That's, that is that's dark. <laughs> I don't mean it as a negative. I mean it as yeah. acknowledging the fact of sure. the matter, which is uh, that they're a publicly <laughs> traded. Company. Yep. No, they're, they got to grow. That's, they have I know. to do this. this. Is the insane end of it's the capitalism. nature of it. I'll and so, okay with are you? I mean, you could. I don't know how. I mean, look, we're ad supported. I'm not negative. I'm not down on ad supported at all. Right. Um, I would. I do you know. feel. I, I agree with you 100. percent I, I I think open is the way forward. I think open is the future. Um, and uh, I, you know where it really I, it came home was with Twitter, right? And yeah. the, and when an open uh, alternative to Twitter came along. Right. It, it was better in a r r number of ways because you couldn't have some guy come along and buy it and, right. then, and turn it into a hellscape. And uh, I, th I thought that was a really good lesson in all of this for everybody. There you go. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Anyway, but uh, but I don't. I think Microsoft is a fairly good steward of its yes. uh, customer base. And I, I really it, think their embrace of open source is... Yeah, astonished. and the ads you know, that they do it. put in Windows, I know we both are on... Mm -hmm. happy about it but it's not it's not awful it's not like a banner ad for a well, laxative i mean it's I, but i will take your role in this discussion and say yet because like you said the scorpion is always going to sting the frog and in yeah. this case we're the frogs and i you know this is the slippery slippery slope argument um it's only going to get worse and it only has gotten worse um and uh Sometimes it takes something really bad before you realize, wow, I didn't realize how much worse it could get. Um, and so we'll see, you know, how this goes. Like they, they, they know the backlash would be so severe if they started really, I mean, putting real ads. These aren't, these are like house ads right now, right? Yeah. What I would like, well, yeah, I mean, uh, sponsored app shortcuts are not really house ads, but I think that, um, but you're right. I mean, but yeah, by and large. And they're, and they're minor, those, you know, look, I, I everybody knows when you install Windows, you go into the start menu and you get rid of all of those stubs mm -hmm. for programs you're never going to buy and, you know, sure. Candy Crush and all that stuff. And everybody, I think everybody or many find it but slightly annoying. they're also trying to find ways to get this stuff in front of you and there'll be pop-ups because there have been pop-ups. There'll be stuff in File Explorer because there has been stuff in File well, Explorer. Well, they got to be careful. They can't go too um, far down this road or people do have, as you pointed out, they I do have know. alternatives. Like I open the, um, I, I read the New York Times every morning and it is a cesspool of advertising and animated nonsense that you can't turn off and I pay for it, you know, and yeah. so... There is well, this model. Well, because it's worth it. <laughs> you know, it's worth it. It's, well, I, we've been debating whether that's worth it, to be honest, for those reasons. But um, anyway, I guess my point is, I, the one thing I do like is this play, model where you can say, look, we have advertising, but if you can, if you want to pay, we'll get rid of the advertising. And I, my my end game here, my my argument is still that um, ad free Outlook experience. Like I just do that for Windows. I just don't want this stuff. Give me a. You know, give me the thing that you give enterprises because enterprises are paying much more for Windows than I am as an individual, uh, and they don't have this junk in Windows when they run Enterprise Edition. I would like to pay for that. I don't want to pay, you know, twenty bucks a month, but I would pay a little bit extra in my as part of my Microsoft three sixty five subscription. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. I want window. I want the thing I'm using to be clean. I got work to do here. I got you know, work to do. I, 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 yeah, I'm not I'm screwing around. Here. Like I'm trying to get work done. Yeah, like it's 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 a little much. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's let's talk 
about some of the new things in yeah. there was a new build uh, today i think yes yeah but let me let's go back in time a little bit because there's been a a few other developments and then we'll get into what happened today and today's thing is not that great anyway so uh, we talked in the past about how microsoft has redesigned file explorer i believe three times over the course of windows 11 yeah three times um, they are working on yet another redesign. This one is actually kind of a major one uh, visually. Um, and I, I, I would say, because I, I just wrote about this for the book, you know, there's this, um, there's an office app in Windows that is being renamed to Microsoft 365. Of course it is. And because they're renaming this thing that everyone knows the name of and now they're confused, there has to be a lot of, uh, not advertising, but just promotional pop-ups. Hey, you know, don't worry, everything's where you left it, blah, blah, blah. Um Microsoft is trying to create a single experience that works well in the what we'll call the Microsoft 365 app in Windows, what will become the Microsoft 365 app on mobile, what will become the Microsoft 365 uh, web app, which is at office.com, by the way, um, a consistent experience. So you have like, uh, you know, your recent art, you know, your recent documents, you have document templates, you have uh, uh, pinned or favorite uh, documents, et cetera, shared documents, all that kind of stuff. So. Um, they are working on a redesign of File Explorer where that's the stuff that comes up in that home page, right? It's going to be very much like that. So um, actually, I mean, I, honestly, I think one of the things I kind of like about File Explorer today is that it's kind of a minimal app, a minimalistic app. I like that. Um, and it looks like they're going to turn it into like a busy thing. <laughs> and I'm not, you know, I just don't. So I, I, I configure my uh, file explorer to go to the this PC view that used to be like my computer or whatever, because I don't like all the nonsense. But if you like nonsense, you're going to love this because there's a lot of nonsense. So that's that's one thing that's coming down. Um, we knew before that Microsoft was going to be uh, testing a tabbed base UI in Notepad. Uh, that appeared in the dev channel um, at the end of last week. So if you're in the dev channel, um, you can check out tabs in Notepad. No surprise there. I, I will say I, I like the look and feel of Notepad today. It's kind of get that WinUI kind of look to it. Um, and as with File Explorer, the, the addition of tabs is a very natural looking thing. I think it's something that's going to be fine. So I don't know that anyone actually needs this, but <laughs> it's fine. It doesn't, doesn't hurt anything. Uh, there's also uh, a sort of, yeah, well, not a sort of. There is a, an, <laughs> an insider program for Microsoft Edge. And their version of the dev channel, which is called the Canary channel to match it to what Google has for Chrome, has started testing an uh, experimental feature called Split Window. So I have a big problem with this. <laughs> so basically what this is, is you can see two web pages at the same time. It's basically a way to take two flag, uh, two tabs and display their content side by side. Now, this will remind people probably of Windows 8. Remember back when you could only have two things on the screen at the same time. But what it should do is make you confused because we already have all these different ways to multitask in Windows. And one of the things that's kind of weird is if you're using a what used to be called like a multi-document interface application, right, which Office used to be over several versions, or a tab-based application like any web browser, and you're doing Alt-Tab to switch between application windows, uh, you can't switch between those tabs. You can only go to the main window, and then you have to use a different key control or use the mouse or whatever to get to a, a document, which is, in this case, in a tab. Windows, I think it was, yeah, Windows 10 has this feature. Windows 11 has this feature where, by default, the first three or five, and you can have 10 or you can have all of them, all the tabs can appear in Alt-Tab. That's kind of a cool little bit of, like, Windows slash Edge integration, I guess. But it's another multitasking overhead thing. You have to kind of manage yourself and just figure out how you want it to be. And now they're going to have like split windows. And like, why I don't, what, like how many times do we need, why do we need this? If we're going to have split tab, uh, split windows in Microsoft Edge, does that mean that tab-based apps like File Explorer and Notepad should have split window feature too, right? I mean, where does it end? Like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Like, what is all this? Why are there so many ways to do things like the same things? I don't know. So. I I don't know. I'm hoping that this won't be turned on by default. It's not on by default now. You have to enable it with a, a, a flag. But So that's how Windows Central, this is what we're looking at. Yeah, you yeah. Know. That's the File Explorer one, yeah. Yeah. So that's how they So, Bleck. 
And then today, we, we got another new uh, dev channel build. This one has exactly one new feature. It is the addition of the first third-party widget to the widgets board, which is for Messenger, meaning Facebook Messenger. Um, exciting. Or as The Verge called it, the dawn of third-party widgets. It's a new era of personal computing. Uh, meaning, to date, the widgets that have appeared, that do appear in the widgets board in Windows 11 are Microsoft widgets, right? So this is the first third-party one. That literally is the only feature that is new in today's build. <laughs> this is what we get. So really exciting on the Windows front. Uh, yeah. So there you go. What else have we got? Uh, da, da, da. We all, Somebody we asked a great question yep. in the chat. And I, I kind of wish okay. this would be the case. It's it's kind of tangential to what we're talking about, but I just thought I'd bring it up. Why? Mm -hmm. I wish um, Microsoft would allow us to put Reddit in instead of Microsoft News. Ooh. Or some that other source, be, you know, uh, of, yeah. uh, an RSS reader uh, or something. Yep. Uh, that would not drive you to Microsoft's content and advertising, so they will never do that. Um, but That's an example it. of where advertising yeah. trumps yeah, it gets, kind of gets user way, yeah. desire. If you like that sort of thing, um, browsers like uh, Vivaldi, is it Vivaldi, Opera, Vivaldi, I think they offer kind of sidebar experiences where you can have that stuff. Uh, yeah, Vivaldi does that, yeah. Outside of you know, whatever you're viewing in the web page, you can kind of have these side experiences. I mean, it, you know, yeah, uh, that's, yeah, sure. I just I just don't want to see MSN, I guess. It's the no problem. Does, Leo, that's why, that's why they're forcing it on you. Right? That's the point. That's how you know no one wants to see it. Uh, they're, they're, they're forcing you. you to see it. <laughs> making you see it. There's no well, choice. Well, I suppose it's possible. Like, uh, well, I don't know. Well, we'll see. I, I, if you're going to allow third-party widgets, there's no reason that you, I mean, I don't know what that would look like, but it would be, instead of, you, you would not have a widget stream from another source, but you could have widgets from a, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, whatever it is you chose, uh, and then position them. Those things, that when you pick those, they go to the top, so they would appear above the stream. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we're going to be able to do that. But, no, that's, uh, yeah, of course you want that. If you want that, don't use Microsoft Edge. I think it maybe is the answer. There you go. Yeah, sorry. Um, we already talked about some of the AR, MR stuff around Microsoft, but I, I did want to just throw this out. I was curious what you thought of this. Um, the latest rumors from Mark Gurman, so probably pretty reliable, is that uh, Apple's $3,000 AR, MR, whatever you're going to call it, headset, is going to have like a digital crown like they have on the Apple Watch. <laughs> but it's yeah. Also, it's we'll nice. have the battery in your pocket with a yeah, wire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, and the reason is it's going to let you switch between AR and VR mode, right? So sometimes I like you'll that be idea. completely... Yeah, I, I can, can see what's I'm going on. Like I'm in the game, but I mm -hmm. want to see what, you know, what's Your going on. Your wife comes in and then you turn it back so you can see yeah. her and you're like, yep, and then you go back. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's you know, yeah, it's, like, it's like noise-canceling headphones that have an on-off yeah. so you can hear the it's world around you. Like and an the, ambient thing. Ambient, yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yep. That makes sense. That kind of a cool, yeah, that's a cool idea. It's not maybe it's not worth three thousand dollars, but it's you know it's. Well, one of the other things Mark said was that Apple was going to defer its augmented reality, its real product, at least until that's right, twenty twenty four, twenty twenty five. Because I think they want those things to be like glasses. They yeah, these, and they said yeah. they can't. They just I think yeah. the real truth is yeah, yeah. they can't do it. They don't have the technology. Right. That's right. Yep. And uh, so what they will do is this three thousand dollar, I know HTC Vive. I guess, you know, or Which Oculus Rift. Very expensive for that kind of thing, but it's Apple and I'm sure it'll be I'm sure that'll it'll be, be great, this but. year and then next year yeah. they'll have a less expensive mm -hmm. consumer version, mm -hmm. but both of those are basically VR helmets, mm -hmm. you know, and this 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 lightweight AR thing. Yeah, could be a long time if ever. I mean, yeah. that's how I read it is we haven't got it working yet. So right. you know, you're going to have to wait until we do. Someday this will just be a uh, contact lens or a, you know, someday, a, a surgery yeah. you can have in your if eye you or whatever. sci-fi, you know. yeah. yeah. Someday. Yeah. It's a very sci-fi concept, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, totally. and as of now, we don't, you know, technology doesn't support that. Right, right. All right, let's talk yeah. about Office Insider. As much as I would love to continue <laughs> to talk about Apple. Sure. This will be a 30-second conversation. So... Uh, I already mentioned this rebranding from Office to Microsoft 365. Two important points here. 
Um, Office doesn't go away. This is one thing people don't quite understand. It's it's in it's literally in the Microsoft fact about this. Like, but they are look, looking at these things that are kind of the uh, user facing. Um, non-Office suite products and saying, look, we're going to start using Microsoft 365 for this stuff. We talked about how the Office app in Windows 11 is being rebranded to Microsoft 365. Um, so they're rebranding the Office Insider Program to the Microsoft 365 Insider Program. And yeah, okay, whatever. Um, I got to tell you, though, I, I really feel like this is this rebranding thing is a big mistake. I, I We've kind of gone through this a little bit in different ways. Remember when you know, Surface products used to have a Surface logo and a Surface, well, Surface name in their font on the back. And then they switched to a Microsoft logo. And the idea there was that the Microsoft brand was better than the Surface brand. And it was more likely to attract potential customers, that kind of thing. Um, the Office brand has been around for 30 years and it's very well understood. And I, I don't understand trying to get rid of most of it. I know that, I like I said, they're not going to get rid of all of it, but uh, Office.com, the Office app, uh, for Windows 11 or for mobile, to me, that just makes sense. That's what that is. Um, I run the Office app on mobile because it has Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. Now, I know it has other things in it, uh, probably like Office Lens capabilities, these other kind of newer services and so forth, and maybe that's why it's Microsoft 365. But I, 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 I this kind of reminds me, and again, I was just going over this history. We'll talk about this soon. Um, about the .NET era, and there was this there was this brief moment of insanity where every single Microsoft product was going to be rebranded. It was going to be Windows.NET, Visual Studio.NET, Visual Basic.NET, you know, Office.NET. Everything everything was .NET, and um, and that didn't last very long. <laughs> it didn't last very long at all. Um, some of the developer products kept it for a few uh, a few years. I think Visual Studio, Visual Basic uh, kept that probably for two or three product revisions, but Windows.net never happened. Windows Server.net never happened. Oh, that, that one was very close. That one came very close to coming out. Um, Office.net never happened. So I, th this, is, this is stupid. Office is a good brand. <laughs> it's a really good brand. You know what else is a good brand? Skype. Keep it. <laughs> what are you doing? People understand, understand what Skype is. People understand what Office is. I don't know. Anyway, that's my little, my little mini rant. Um, which will lead into my next mini rant, which is about Slack and the EU. So Politico reported uh, this week that the European Union is about to launch an antitrust against Microsoft uh, for abuses related to Microsoft Teams, right? Um, this is based on a, th guess a who? half, three-year-old. Yeah. yeah, guess who? Slack. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing. Here, here's the thing. If you go back and read the original Slack complaint, which is hilarious, um, a couple of things to remember. Um, this was, like I said, almost three years ago. Uh, they had not yet been bought by Salesforce, which, to my mind, really undercuts their case in the same way that when AOL acquired Netscape during the Microsoft antitrust trial, it kind of undercut the argument that that company had no way out because they were being bullied by this big company. When, In fact, it looks like you're worth a lot of money because AOL just paid a lot of money for you. Um, Slack was acquired for $27.7 billion later in 2021, or in 2021, which is about a year after the, the complaint. The other thing is Slack at the time referred to Teams as a weak copycat product, which I don't think was ever technically true, but let's say it was when Teams first launched. Teams launched in 2017. So by the time this argument came around, this was three years later, Teams had evolved into an incredibly feature-rich application that far surpassed anything that was possible in Slack. Today, another, what are we now, three, almost three years later? That's doubly true. Um, but apparently the EU liked that argument because <laughs> they're about to announce their own little, um, uh, I guess, well, I guess what they're going to launch is a statement of objections. I don't know what the actual, actual language we use for this kind of stuff is. It's a... They're already investigating Microsoft. They apparently have seen enough that they will now, I guess we'll, we'll call this a complaint, I guess. And then Microsoft has to address it. And I, I don't know. There could be a, could be an antitrust case for Microsoft. So that's fun. You know, this, and it's like the good old days again. We got Activision Blizzard. We got this. Who else can we beat up on? Um, I would feel sorry for these companies, except I guess this is I know. Yeah, part exactly. of the, yeah. you know, 
part of doing sure. business, but gosh, it'd be Bills hard to be a company that's just constantly fighting all these jurisdictions well, over stuff. Y- yeah, the, actually, that right, that's actually a huge problem. Um, I don't, I, you know, okay, so actually, let me let me look at some of the uh, substantive things that they complained about. Uh, they claim that Teams is force installed on millions of people. Uh, Microsoft blocks the removal of Teams. And Microsoft is hiding the true cost to enterprise customers, which is kind of hilarious. But um, I don't. I have to manually install Teams. I I have a Microsoft 365 business account, and I have to. It's not part of my office install. I have to. I have to go get it. I don't know what they're talking about. I, even now, like I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, we'll see what happens here. It's but. sort of like the complaint against uh, Internet Explorer that is pre-installed. It's very right? much like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, remember, see, we forget this stuff. And again, I'm going over this history again, but um, you know what the the big, uh, one of the big bullying tactics that Microsoft employed with IE was they made it available for free, right? Because Netscape was sort of free, but if you were a business, you actually you were supposed to actually pay for it. Like Microsoft's like, no, we're just going to give it away. And and we're going to integrate it with Windows. And it was like, oh, <laughs> like, what do you do? You know, like, it's kind of interesting that Microsoft giving away free software was kind of the central part of that complaint and uh they had you know, that was you know talk about open source so giving something away for free that they had that had to go through some channels as well but anyway um and if you can't get enough of antitrust uh you'll be delighted to know that the doj here in the united states has announced an antitrust case against google and i strongly recommend <laughs> going back and so google has issued a response to this and in the google response they reference a um, uh, God, I think it was, yeah, January, 2022 post that they wrote about a very, a somewhat similar Texas case against them about the advertising business. That 2022 post that Google had is classic. <laughs> like it's awesome. And, um, if you can look at their response to the DOJ lawsuit, they, they reference it and you can go read it yourself. I, I remember that it's, I, I, they, they referenced Texas and I was like, wait a minute, this sounds really familiar. And I wrote about this because I thought it was so beautiful. Like, <laughs> this is really funny. Like the Texas case against them, they actually, because there were so many um, <laughs> mistakes and uh, not just like uh, errors in fact, but just, just accusations that had nothing to do with whatever was happening. Texas had to rewrite this lawsuit three different times. <laughs> Because Google kept pointing out, like, that's not true. Uh, that's not true. You know, that kind of thing. So, like, they're comparing the uh, U.S. Department of Justice antitrust lawsuit against them to the one from Texas. Honestly, other than the surface level stuff, they're not that similar. And the big deal here is, and this is the this is the interesting tenet of antitrust in the United States today uh, that has yet to be tested, which is this notion of divesting um, previous acquisitions from big tech. So they're going to try to divest DoubleClick, which Google bought in 2015, I think. It's been a long time, yeah. It's been a long time. And uh, this is what pe- this is what a lot of people want these days. They want uh, Facebook to lose Instagram. You know, they want Google to lose DoubleClick, et cetera. Um, interesting. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I will say uh, Google is in the online ad market uh, number one with a bullet. Um, Facebook is the only thing that's anywhere close to them. But even companies like... Uh, Amazon and uh, Microsoft are distant, distant. I think Microsoft at best is like the number six player, seven, something like that. Um, TikTok has been a recent player in this market that's done really well. Um, I don't know. Anyway, I just I, I just think it's fascinating that uh, they're going after Google for that. So, okay. That's a- we'll see. Yeah, we will. You, 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 you hear a lot of these lawsuits being started. <laughs> I know. You don't hear a well, lot about the, them so, ending. Right. I don't know if we ever talked about this, but um, uh, last week Spotify put out a public letter and said, hey, European Union, you passed a law that makes what Apple's doing illegal. Right. Are you going to enforce it? <laughs> you know? Right. Like, they're killing us over here. What are you doing? And they had a bunch of companies that are, not all music companies, like uh, some of them were like, uh, not e-commerce, but... Um, just other types of services, uh, whatever they were, they had apps in the app store. Like, guys, you can't let Apple keep taking money from us when you said that doing that is illegal. You have to enforce it now. So, yeah, I we'll see what, uh, if anything, I don't know. We're not going to live long enough to see the end of this. Who cares? 
Uh, while you were doing your ad uh, earlier. You got booze. I got oh, I, I did get booze, but I also got an email from GitHub, so I haven't had a chance oh. to write about this. Uh -huh. But in 2019, GitHub set a goal so that they would have 100 million developers using the service by 2025, and they just surpassed that number this week. So they have over 100, 100 million, million developers wow. using GitHub, yeah. Wow. Yep. Yeah, that's interesting. I use, um, I think we talked about this. Obviously, I published my software pro uh my software projects to GitHub, but I also use um, GitHub to store my book repositories, which I always find really funny to say, by the way. Um, book repository. Uh, yeah, so all my books are in GitHub as well. So we use, actually use a Git, GitHub command line tools to uh, uh, push all of my updates up to LeanPub so it can be published. So it's not just developers. Nice. 100 million. I yeah. use it. I use it. Yep. Yeah. No, yeah, in fact, for a long time, I when I first started writing books, I thought it'd be really cool to use, we didn't have GitHub, but uh, SVN or right. some sort of, because uh, yeah. I had a co-author, and I thought we could, we never really, mm -hmm. I tried, I set it up, but never really got it uh, working with the co-author, but Gina Smith, but uh, right. I've always thought that'd be a great way to write books. Plus, you have yeah, it is. track yeah. all the previous versions mm -hmm. and things, and you can you know, refer. Yeah, you screw and, something up, you can get yeah. it back. If, you know, it's yeah. really uh, the best thing for me is I use multiple computers, and getting this thing onto multiple exactly. computers is as easy as a Trivial. single command. It's a, yeah, yeah, it's really nice. Gets an amazing uh, invention. Yeah, yep. And uh, yep. W for all the trouble about Microsoft acquiring GitHub, uh, I think that uh, it's turned out all right. <laughs> it's turned out pretty well. Uh, yeah, they've done a great job with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Good job. Again, I can't so believe just, I'm, also I'm the, the one praising okay. Microsoft on this show. There Jeez you go. Louise. You're all over the map, Leo. Come I on. I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. No, this, good and bad. this is good and bad. I mean, for sure. Yeah, um, any big company, sure. So I've been, I've been sort of, I, I, it's weird. I have a, a short article about GitHub. I, Git and GitHub I started writing. And I haven't finished yet. I have a short article about .NET Maui I've started and haven't finished yet. And then today... Uh, Flutter announced, or uh, Google announced, uh, Tim Sneath at Google announced uh, what the plans are for the future of Flutter. And it's interesting because these things to me all kind of overlap each other a little bit. And um, it, part of my .NET Maui thing was trying to figure out, like, you know, how or when does this thing make sense to create uh, desktop applications? And part of the big deal with Flutter right now is last year they shipped, I believe this is out and stable, is the ability to publish to the web, publish to uh, Windows, and publish to... The Mac, right? So you can you can create like Windows desktop apps with Flutter. It's kind of interesting. Um, I haven't looked at that too much lately, or, or at all, actually. I should say, um, and I should. Um, the stuff they announced today about the future is not particularly interesting. I think to us, generally speaking, it doesn't really impact the the desktop too too much. Although the ability to uh, embed Flutter code in the web using um, Using what? Using web. What's the word I'm looking for? Using, where is it? Whatever. Using, why can't I find this thing? Is it not in my article? Web. Oh boy. I lost my brain there. I saw somebody getting excited about Flutter today on Mastodon. So what happened? Yeah. So one, of, they just announced stuff they're doing for the future. But one of the, they're supporting Risk Risk 5. Is that the name of Risk Oh, Risk V. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Risk 5. Yeah. So, uh, okay, that's neat. I mean, that's, that's kind of huge. out there a little bit. That's yeah. open, but open, that's open hardware and software. That's great. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, more importantly, I think one of the, the thing that really struck me was they're supporting uh, embedding Flutter code into HTML using WebAssembly, right, which is, is supported in all the major browsers. So that's really interesting because it really gives the possibility of kind of the full Flutter experience on the web. It also reminds me a little bit, see if I can pull this out of my butt, the ActiveX they had a little ActiveX kit. Remember, you could make these stupid little ActiveX components and put them on it, but you had to, you know, how to use IE. <laughs> you know, it was like a, a thing back in the day with Microsoft, probably in the very late 90s. Um, but whatever, this is uh, web assemblies, uh, a standard of sorts. So this is kind of interesting. So, okay, whatever. But this this doesn't really impact Windows. It's it's I'm interested in this, but it's not, you know, that impactful. But the issue of using these cross-platform frameworks, uh, we'll call them, to create desktop apps in an era where we're never going to have another desktop framework for windows right we're done that this is never going to happen like how does this make sense and i'm not sure about flutter uh flutter might be further along they certainly came out first but when i look at dotnet maui 
Um, there are, you know, desktop controls, like things like uh, top-level menu bars, floating windows, you know, blah, 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 those kind of simple things. And that's great. But I really feel like um, anyone who's tried to use dot, dot, dot .NET MAUI, you just do like the, you bring up the sample app that they have, you click a button and it increments a little alien guy. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mobile app. This is a mobile app. This is a mobile app that will run on iPhone and Android. It runs on windows in a window. It will run on the Mac in a window, but it's a mobile app, right? Um, I think that's where they're going with this. In other words, the idea here is you're a developer, you're creating a new app. You want to target all the platforms that make sense. And iOS and Android would be at the top of mind for most of these things, whatever it is. It could be like a cool little mobile game. It could be a, like just a little uh, app. It doesn't matter what it is. Just a little mobile app, right? Um, I think what they're doing is not so much so you can create like a new desktop app, but so that you can take a mobile app and have it make sense on Windows, right? By adding those controls that only appear when you're running it on Windows. So maybe you'll have like a top-level menu bar, like I said. Maybe when you do like a system about or whatever, it, it brings up an actual window instead of just replacing the view inside of the phone screen. And I think that's what it is, right? Like, in other words, this thing, I don't know Flutter, but I would say .NET MAUI is not about creating a desktop app. It's about it creating a mobile app that will seem a little more native when you're running it on desktop. I think that's all it is, you know? And it, whether or not it evolves to be a little more mature and have more features that make sense on desktop is, you know, well, I guess we'll see. But in its current form, even an application like my .NET pad is basically impossible to create in .NET MAUI. Whereas I think it would be very possible to create it in Flutter. So again, I think I just think it's further ahead. Just it's just kind of an observation. I was just kinda of in writing about this stuff and then I was writing about Flutter today. I was like, how do these things kind of line up, you know? And I think I think I haven't used Flutter as much, like I said, but I think Flutter is further along and maybe as a result has more going on. <laughs> now you make me want to want to investigate it more. I, I I played with it a little bit. I think I have a couple of yeah. books. So Dart's the language and Flutter's the framework. Right. Uh, they go hand in hand. I mean, you could you could write code in Dart by itself, but but they yeah. pretty much go hand in hand. And I did play with it a little bit, and was I was very impressed. I really I it's, like it. It's a nice like framework if you I, want to write cross platform mobile apps, for instance. The, I think the yeah, I think the big debate here is whether you would, as a developer, would use like React Native instead of Flutter. Yeah, Maybe that's, that's the, the comparison. That's, yeah, exactly. I, the thing, you know, coming from the Microsoft world, we have this thing called XAML, which is an XML-based language for a, a lot of things, but one of the, we use it for creating UIs. And so you you describe a UI in XAML in the same way that you might describe a web UI in HTML. You can style it like you would with CSS, CSS in HTML, um, and you can access it programmatically on the web. You would use JavaScript typically, but uh, C Sharp, right, on the Microsoft stuff. Um XAML is more powerful than HTML, obviously. Well, or there is. I mean, it's not obvious, but it is. Um, it's and, and it's it, it's the type of thing that kind of makes sense if you come from the HTML world. But Flutter uses a different paradigm where you actually describe the UI using Dart code. So it's the same code you, that you know you write your software logic in or whatever uh, is used to describe the UI. So it's a completely different way to do it, but it still has a hierarchy to it. So it's it's very it's different because of that it's um, it's a different experience uh, than writing um, UI in other languages. Uh, so it's it's curious. Like I'm very I'm interested in it too. I just don't I think know. it's more modern. Probably uh, yeah. there used to be uh, this MVC mm -hmm. framework, uh, and right. now they've gotten away from that. And as I remember, Flutter does no, the MVC is the new oop. Yeah, it's, it's like, become the new oop, which little, is no. It's a little no top longer, heavy. Yeah, yeah, no longer yeah. the way to go. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, rem as I remember vaguely, uh, Flutter does it uses something more, a little more modern, but similar. Um, I like the idea. I really like the idea of it. You could write this really is, I, for any screen. You can write right. for ARM yeah. or Intel this is or the now dream, right? This is the yeah. right ones run everywhere. Like this yeah. is what we've been talking about this since Java. <laughs> One of the reasons I I use Lisp <laughs> is because it hasn't changed since the eighties. Yeah. You know, the the final common Lisp spec was uh, written in I think ninety four. Right. And it's it's in stone. And I've been burnt so many times with Perl and then with Python. And I'm mm -hmm. very nervous about Flutter for the same reason that right. people come along. You know, Python 2, I learned it. It was great. And then sure. all of a sudden, it's Python 3. Perl was worse. 
uh, Pearl yeah. 5 uh, broke everything. Well, okay. So, I mean, Python, I think, has persisted. I think it's, you know. Yeah. But, I mean, um, Python 3 is, is pretty different than Python 2. And yeah. It's a bit yeah. of a, a lift for me to... I should probably be using Python. That's what everybody uses, and you know, and it's not super performant. But but every, it, listen, you could find, people complain about everything. It's like, um, you know, Node.js, right, which is kind of a standard for like a JavaScript runtime. Um, people now are pushing. There's all kinds of alternatives, a, eh? but like people now are like, oh, like Node.js was so 2018. Yeah, that's the problem, <laughs> and it's and always it's the like, flavor I, of the month. Yeah, and then it's all whole. And I don't want. I want to spend less time. Yeah. Yep, learning <laughs> sure. and, and remembering way, and studying yeah. an API than I want to code. So you referenced uh, the source code for the Lisa was released right on its Pascal. Whatever, 40, yeah, you, yeah, I was going to say, do you see the language? Looks it's, like it's, Delphi. It's Pascal. <laughs> I know. Oh, you it's like it. Pascal. Yeah, I, I was like, I, why would I want to see the source code? And I was like, wait, it's it's in Pascal. You know oh, it. You it's a language yeah, you're very familiar. That's with. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, plus that plus sixty eight thousand assembler. There's a lot of assembler code in it uh, yeah. as well. Oh, yeah, of course. Yep. I do. I just um, for me, I like the idea that anything I write today in Lisp will run in when I'm yeah. dead in <laughs> thirty years. Not that anybody would want to run it, but it would. It, it, it's not going to change. Programs you wrote in the nineties still work today without modification. Yep. Uh, you wouldn't do this, but if you uh, wanted to go the .NET route, I think that stuff would always work. Um, really? Uh, it, it doesn't oh, change? Yeah. yeah? Okay. That's no, what I mean, I, well, it changes. Or it, it evolves, but I that was as part of that series I did. It's astonishing how much code from back in the day still like works fine. Like It's crazy. Uh, it's it's really yeah. interesting. I, I um, mean, you know, obviously I'm, uh, I'm giving up a lot of stuff by using uh, Lisp, and especially yeah. what Flutter <laughs> offers, which is this idea sure. of a very graphical user interface that works on a well, variety Flutter is, of screens. But that's what Flutter, Flutter literally is uh, a UI toolkit. You know, that's yeah. the point of it, right? And yeah. I, but Dart's a very nice language. I mean, I, I'd be comfortable with Dart. It's a... Uh, it's a little Python like, a little you know, anybody's used a Yeah. Well it's C. another it's C got some functional like language capability. It's got curly braces. It's yeah. A, you know. Yeah. It looks very But familiar. the thing the thing that separates, I don't know if you could ever find a good example of it, is the in in describing the UI of an application, there's a there's an interesting kind of hierarchy in code where you know, you know, you you put I don't know what the terminology is like objects inside of objects basically, and then the you know the uh, the properties of the containing object can or cannot, depending on how you write it, be uh, pushed into the contained object, so to speak. It's 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 really interesting. Like it's it's just kind of fascinating the way they. It's a different way to do it. I've just never seen anything quite like it. Although I guess someone will probably look at it and say, "Yeah, this is how HTML works." So like it's probably I'm sure it's based on something. I'm, it seems like the the hierarchical nature of it is. Has got to be based on the past, but it's uh, it's interesting. It's just an interesting way to write it. I've never seen like a C-like language used to do that kind of thing. Is uh, is it objects or is it more like a DOM, like the? Yeah, um, yeah, I can't answer that. I'm not really sure. It is objects. Um, is it based on a DOM? Is it a DOM-like system of uh, like a DOM-like hierarchy? It probably is. Probably actually, is right. right? I, I, probably is. It's so web, it's web it focused. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's it was mobile focused from the beginning, but they, I'm sure they wanted to attract you know. It supports PWA, uh, which reactive. is really nice, and I'm very mm -hmm. that's I'm happy about that. You know, I always like <laughs> solve these advent of code problems. I always want to write a visualization, and doing so in Lisp is yeah. a little bit more challenging sure. than it would be in other languages. <laughs> <laughs> Just write it to a, like a, a TTY. Uh, I, I, you know, honestly, yeah. uh, in many cases, I just do it. Yeah, it's a command yeah, line. Sure. It's just a two. It's eighty columns. Yeah, and, you know. yeah. Just spit out te text. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I took a class. It was just about organizing text to that format. Yeah. That's all it was. Yeah. Like you know, a yeah. million years ago. But. Text user interfaces, twoies. Um, yeah. I think we've come a little farther along, and I would love to be able to just have it open sure. a web page and have the visualization uh, there using modern technologies. I'll I'll take. A, I want to take more of a look at the Flutter. And, and darn. As I said, I have a book, but now they've the book is probably out of date. <laughs> I right. had to buy all new Python books, and they're a lot thicker than they were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I use them as doorstops now, so that's right, good. Right, right. Uh, moving, moving right along. Mm -hmm. uh, should we talk about .NET since you mentioned it and Maui Wowie? Well, we, I just I kind of alluded to okay. it. I, I just I, I the I, the Flutter thing just reminded me of .NET Maui, and I was just thinking like what. 
Maui is supposedly, you know, good to go for desktop development. And I feel like it's not really, it's really for, it's just, .NET Maui is what Xamarin Forms was, which is a way to create cross-platform mobile apps. Um, Windows Phone is gone, so that part of it's gone. But now it also supports Mac and Windows. But it does it in the same way that you might run a, um, like an iPhone app on the Mac, right? It, the idea is it's still the mobile app, but I'm, we're going to tailor it potentially. You don't have to, but you can. I, um, with control, a handful of controls, really not that many, but some number of controls that are desktop specific that make that thing maybe feel a little more natural on that platform. And, you know, obviously you can code it in such a way that whatever those desktop controls were will not appear when you run it on an iPhone because they wouldn't make sense on that device, like that kind of thing. Um, I feel like Flutter is, you, you could just go to Flutter and say, I'm just going to create like a desktop app and I'm going to make it, it will run on the web too. Or like I'm going to target multiple platforms, but I'm not going to put this thing on iOS and Android. Like I'm going to make a, an app app, you know, like when I talked to um, Tim Sneath last year, I was telling him about those, you know, notepad apps that I had written uh, across windows forms, WPF and uh, UWP. And he said, yeah, he goes, I, I wrote a notepad app in flutter. <laughs> I was like, really? Uh, that's cool. So I haven't looked, I still have never looked at it, but he, to do that, what he had to use was a, f a feature of the Dart language, which is that it can read C libraries. And of course, a lot of the notepad stuff on Windows relies on native features that are available through the C API. Oh, and that's how he's able to get it done. That's really cool. Hmm. Yeah. You got to have a foreign language interface these yeah. days. Yeah. Yep. Anyway. Yeah, I don't think I'll be doing any Flutter. For one thing, it's not uh, so, that yeah. native Apple Silicon native. You have to use oh. Rosetta, at least for oh. developing. And they really want you to use Android Studio, which is uh, Google's I know, which is IDE, great. and I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Sorry. This is like the IntelliJ <laughs> thing. I know, yeah. that, that I'm sure I can use good. VS Code. I I would be surprised uh, if I could. Yeah, actually, you can. Yeah. You can for yeah. Flutter. Yep, that's true. Yeah. It's a little yeah. maybe too Googly, too. I mean, I'm trying to take a little, get a little I, Google out of my life, you know? Yep. I don't like Android Studio. I want to. I just never do. No, no. Well, it's IntelliJ. It's their version of it's, uh, like it's, yeah, not, it's icky. It's icky. Yeah. And uh, two eagles. Uh, no, it's two turkeys. What was it? Two turkeys yeah. don't make an eagle. Don't make an eagle. I, I know uh, Paul Holder in our uh, chat will yell at me because he's a big <laughs> uh, he's a big IntelliJ user. He's a Java. Oh, really? Well, he's a Java guy. Yeah, but this is just like a Stockholm syndrome. Like, like <laughs> it's it's like that time I, uh, I I met Mary Jo at that hotel in San Francisco, and Oracle World was happening. Yeah, and I stood up on one of the chairs and I said, "Attention, Oracle developers!" <laughs> oh God! And for a moment, the room just went silent, and I said, "You are all wasting your lives." So that <laughs> pulled me off the chair. <laughs> You're a bold man. How many uh, how many beers did you had? That's of people in there. <laughs> that's, a, that's a bold thing to do. <laughs> no, I was mad because they were in my hotel. See, I would have been staying at that hotel, ah, but it was full because of this stupid conference. It's their fault. Yep. I think you deserve a little uh, amuse-bouche, or perhaps it's uh, more like, uh, what do they call that thing in between courses to refresh the palate? A yeah, palate no, cleanser no. from well, Xbox. Uh, an Xbox yeah, palate, palate cleanser. cleanser. We used to get like a little uh, sherbet. A little or, sherbet, um, remember? Yeah. Like that, yeah, little grapefruit like shirt. Hoity toity days. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you heard this, by the way. I didn't put this in the notes, but um, uh, apparently, uh, there's a lot of like this made it to Fox News. There's a lot of right wing um, pushback against certain things in the world right now. So, for example, there was a M &M's. story about how Eminence is one, um, the uh, gas ovens is one, yeah, right? That's right another. Now they one. want to take your gas ovens away. Um, and then one, and then Xbox made the list because Microsoft just came up with the new power management mode we talked about last week, where it's saving energy. And I will say, you know, like I, I do things like I go into like if you go into a Windows Update, there's a little green leaf icon at the bottom, and it says Windows Update is committed to helping reduce carbon emissions. And you click a link, and you, of course it you know goes to a website, and you learn about how they're reducing carbon emissions, right? And you're like, I don't care. <laughs> I don't know. What, what are you doing? And Microsoft's response to this has been, guys, first of all, you can turn it to any setting you want. If you want to leave this thing running 24 hours a day, you can do that. Like this is this, we're trying to do the right thing for the environment as, as the default setting, but you can, you know, you can set it up, you, whatever, right? The, the 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 difference between this setting and the normal setting is that if you come back to the Xbox after like a day of it being off, 
uh, it will take you know 15 seconds to boot up rather than five seconds. So it's it's a it's a huge inconvenience. <laughs> All done in the name of wokeness. So anyway, all right. Isn't that anyway. funny? It's you know this is the it, it's it, it yeah. irks me a little bit because these are smart yeah. people. They know better. Yeah. They know this is a made made up. Well, but they also know that people get riled but up. But it gets people and, riled up, you know, and grumble, that's grumble, grumble. That's you know, good yeah. for a business, and sure. it's a shame because they know that. I mean, I think the claim is that well, it's just a matter of time before the Xbox uh, you know turns itself off. Uh, during peak usage hours, you know, <laughs> sure. I think that's what they're sure. they're assuming. Uh, okay. And well, it's I, they I, know better. They know better. It's just all about getting people upset, uh, and there's so much of that. Who cares? Okay. Who, the, and I can't believe what? Eminem actually fired the spokes Eminems <laughs> because of Tarleton Cocker or whatever his name is, Kemper Tarson. Yeah. And I just that, it makes me idiot. Yeah. yeah, that guy. You know. So give me five seconds for my Xbox to come on because I want to look at this. <laughs> Boot her up. Here Boot her up. Ooh, look at they, they, there's an ad. It says join us for the developer direct show. That's no. a good ad. That's a good ad. That's a good, that's a good ad. Yeah. They must know your developer because so, that's not. They're not going to show that. That's to a weird one. So Tommy. power options is one of the one of the top level things, right? So today we have two choices. We have shutdown, which saves energy, and we have sleep, which does not save energy, and that's the one I have uh, customized. I. I, whatever I, you know what I, I, you can customize it um, you can change the setting you can actually choose a setting then customize that setting I, to me this is fine the bigger issue I have is that uh, Microsoft uh, or rather the Xbox has a quick resume feature and what they do is they look at the games like this is not something you as a developer can say I want to support quick resume they, they'll just look at the game and Microsoft determines whether or not it does it's up to you as a developer to target it but Microsoft determines it. You don't. You don't get to determine it. And the idea is that the game will set up faster. So I, I have my Xbox set up so it comes on really fast. And the games I play, sorry, the game I play. Yeah, really. <laughs> Let's be presume. honest. So it, okay, you know, okay, sorry. I know. I'm, I always exaggerate. Come on. <laughs> you <laughs> the know. many games that I play. Anyway, they, it, it supports uh, this feature, but it doesn't really. Here's the problem: the, the, the it has fallen apart. And this is not something I can use or I can configure as a user. So if I see problems related to quick resume, I can't say, you know what, this isn't working. Don't quick resume. So the way this exhibits itself, because Call of Duty is the most horrible game ever created with its multi-level UI nonsense, is I played Call of Duty early in the day. In the, day. <clears throat> the Xbox has gone to sleep maybe, or it, I don't know, whatever, it doesn't matter. I come back later and I, I launch it again from the uh, dashboard. And it runs, and, it, and it, I click past some screens. I go to the point where I'm going to start the game. I click, it, start, it tries to find a game, and then it says, oh, the playlist has changed. You're like, okay. And then you're like, you have to restart. You're like, oh, I have to restart? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So I restart it. And then I go through that process again. It says, oh, hold on a second. This other thing changed. To avoid that, what I do is before I start the game the second time, I right-click on or, you know, I, whatever the button is, you click to bring up the menu. I quit the game. Then I just start it from scratch because if I don't do that, I go through that nonsense. And what that is is quick resume failing. <laughs> it's like quick resume doesn't work for this game. It doesn't work. So I have to I have to hard crash the game before I start it. That's, that's so what? That's, that's an actual problem with the Xbox, and it has nothing to do with being woke. It just is a stupid technical <laughs> issue. It's just they'll yeah. fix that so, though, right? No, no. This, I did I did this today. This is a pro, this is still a problem. That's silly. So. People have complained about this, yeah. not just with this game. This I happens across multiple games. And yeah. Microsoft has said, well, we're going to look at a way where you can determine on a game-by-game -game basis whether or not you want Quick Resume to be there. So there you go. They're going to fix it. Or maybe they already fixed I don't even know if they fixed it. Maybe they didn't fix it. I don't know. Uh, I think they're going to fix it if they haven't. But it, every day, I have to hard crash Call of Duty so I can play Call of Duty. That's how stupid this console is. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, I guess worry about the power management thing that you can disable, but That's, you know, let's not worry about this thing I can't disable. It. <laughs> That's really not. I know it's it's incredible. Not good, yeah, it's incredible. Huh. Okay, okay, <clears throat> moving right Big along. Cat here. Yes, Big cat. Big cat. Let's talk about right. uh, James <laughs> Bond. Yeah, so um, the original game, uh, GoldenEye 007, was on the. Nintendo 64, 64, right? Yeah, yeah, classic. Now, I did not I did not own a Nintendo 64, so I did not really play this game. 
Um, I, re- I by the way rented a Nintendo sixty four a couple of times. Really? Uh, back yeah, you could just go to like a video rental store. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah rent, rent rent the console, rent a couple yeah. of games. Like, yeah. It was a Mario flying game of some kind, I recall. And anyway, visually impressive for the time for sure. Anyway, this game is credited as being the first playable console shooter. Right. It also like, had cooperative mode, which was pretty right. darn cool. You could do split screen with up to four players. Mm-hmm. You play, you know, single player by yourself, obviously. Um, <clears throat> so that that's interesting to me because for me, it wasn't until I guess it was Halo that kind of proved that uh, shooters could work on a console. But this game, of course, predated that by about four years. So um, it's interesting on that note. I'm, I'm going to go. I am definitely going to take a look at this. I'm kind of curious about four this game. players split screen. And yeah, this should so look available. really good on the Xbox. This will be really... Insane. I <laughs> well, presume they've upgraded the graphics, right? No, this looks a lot like Quake 2 to me. Um, I, <laughs> it I says faith... Yeah, okay, there you go. It says it's faithfully uh, recreated and improved, yeah. enhanced. Yeah, 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 so. yeah. There but, you go. You know, it's, it, looks, yeah. it looks like it's, it's up to It's chunky. Okay. That's, yeah, that's no, okay. but you wouldn't want it to look better because it would be like, well, that's not my... That wasn't my, <laughs> that wasn't <laughs> my game. Yeah, well, this, this was a game lot game, of so nostalgic, right. but yeah, but it was a lot of yeah. people's and a lot of yeah. nostalgic people. No, I know people that. I know that. I recognize excited. it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's cool. cool. That's a, that's a smart so thing. Coming, we're recording this on Wednesday, the twenty fifth. This will be out on Friday. If you don't subscribe to Game Pass, can you still get it? You can buy it. Yeah, okay, you, can, you buy can buy it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Cool. That's really cool. Good for them. Yeah. Um, and it's also coming on the Switch. By the way, too. But Xbox, Ooh, Xbox I might play it on the Switch. Switch. Although, I, yeah, like you, I never had an, an N64, so I didn't. Uh, I don't have that same yeah. nostalgic thrill. <laughs> but I like I, I like games of that era, and I've played oh, yeah. you know ma- I've played many games of that era multiple times. Right. Um, I just didn't have a, an N64, so yeah, that's interesting. January twenty seventh. Yeah, and then the other thing. This is only uh, slightly related, but Sony this week shared their launch lineup for PlayStation VR two, which is that coming headset. Um, they have got many games. Um, it is fascinating to me um, how they've kind of pushed forward with this and how Microsoft just continues to ignore it. Um, I had always kind of held out hope that uh, the Windows mixed reality headsets would be brought to the Xbox. Why not? Uh, but that's never happened, and I'm not sure. I don't. God knows if they're even doing anything with it. It's going to be expensive. Uh, the VR headset, uh, the original VR headset, was about four hundred dollars. This one's five fifty. Yeah, which is means it's more expensive than a PlayStation. Yikes! <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Yikes! But yeah, I played it when it first came out. Uh, we had a guy yeah. on who got- uh, worked at Sony, and I <clears throat> we did the thing. It was cool. I think, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, the only use case for VR is games. There you go. Productivity, yeah. no way. Teams, you know, like the legless no people way. floating around? I want to see that guy like this. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no. Eh. And, and, yeah. and yet, even with games, I think it has some limited appeal. Some, uh, some significant portion of users get nauseated by it. Yeah, I did when I tried uh, whatever the first one. Yeah. Uh, what was the thing I tried? The pl- I think the PlayStation uh, VR that I used, we were sit- you had to be sitting down. I don't know okay. if that's still the case. No, the ad, they, the little you can stand promo up. video they have shows the guy standing Moving up in around. his room. Yeah. All right, so this yeah, is how be long careful ago doing that, that was. <laughs> I would fall over, I yeah. can already tell. Yeah. Just put pillows all over the place. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's fun. I guess there's, you know, there's obviously a market for it. 600 bucks, wow. There's a market for it. It's crazy. Clearly. Yep. Yeah, they've had great success with it. I mean, they sold millions of units, I know that, uh, of the hardware, so... I guess it's going great for them. I don't, it's interesting how they've been able to differentiate in this way, and Microsoft's always been like, yeah, no, no thanks. Mm-mm. All right. But that's their position. Before we get to the picks of the week, I'd like to do mm-hmm. a little plug for our okay. club. Uh, and the reason I think it's important is because Paul actually has a show, club-only show, called Hands on Windows, and I know a lot of people want that. There is a way to just buy it by itself, uh, 2 99 $2.99 a month for, I think, four episodes. You do one a week. Uh, mm-hmm. And we do put some of the, you know, uh, we cherry pick a few and put those in public on a YouTube feed. But right. really, if you want to get all the hands-on Windows or the hands-on Mac with Micah or the Untitled Linux show or the all the other stuff we do club only, 
and you want to support Twit, and you want to have ad-free versions of all of our shows, I would submit that the best thing you could do is to go to twit.tv slash club twit and sign up. Seven bucks a month. It's nothing. It's nothing, and it it makes a it's something to us. It makes a huge difference. We've got some events coming up. Lisa and I did an inside twit that was club only last week. Uh, we do the Stacy's book club every month in there. Win to Dow is coming up on Thursday, February 9th for a fireside chat. Uh, Daniel Suarez will be joining us for a special triangulation. Yeah. His new book just came out or is about to come out at the end of the month, um, and. Uh, Daniel, of course, will come in and, and spend some time in the studio. And we're going to make that public as a triangulation episode. We'll also put a part of it on the Ask the Tech Guy show. But if you want to ask Daniel questions, you need to be in the club on uh, February 10th at 11 a.m. So that's something we'd like to, you know, obviously we want to offer. Most people don't pay for the club by far. 95%, 98% actually of uh, Twit listeners don't pay for the club. So, of course, we're going to continue to offer as much stuff as we can, ad-supported and free, because, you know, uh, we, you know <laughs> that's our business. That's, we, we like you guys. But at, to the degree that we can get members in the club, uh, it makes a huge difference for us financially, and it gives us a chance to do some other extra stuff. Samable Samit will be in there on uh, March 2nd for an AMA. Uh, we have shows. It's a place we can launch shows. <clears throat> test them out like hands-on windows. That's how This Week in Space got launched. We launched it in the club. Club members supported it. And then we made it public. In fact, they're about to add uh, video to that. We're going to add video to the Untitled Linux show, too, thanks to Club Twit members. So being in the club, uh, beside, oh, and I didn't even mention the Discord. It's a wonderful place to hang out. It's a really great social environment, not just during the shows, but at all times. We have a coding uh, group that I hang out there uh, all the time with our my fellow uh coders it's so much fun uh twit.tv slash club twit seven bucks a month there's an 84 dollar year subscription there's corporate memberships as well do it because you want to support what we do you like what we do you want to keep the lights on and keep the staff employed and keep the shows coming but you do get some great benefits for it it's okay to, it's okay it's a win-win all around uh, and thank you in advance to all of our uh, Club Twit members. To everybody, members or not, uh, a reminder that our survey continues but is ending at the end of the month. So you've got six more days to go to twit.tv slash survey23. The survey helps us get to know you a little bit better. We don't track you. We don't want to know anything about you. We can't with an RSS podcast. This isn't Spotify. We don't, we don't, we don't collect information about you. So this survey once a year helps us. Uh, with advertisers, we can at least say, you know, a little bit about our audience. It helps us know what we're doing right and wrong. Uh, and, it's a, and it's an easy thing to do. It's, of course, completely optional. But if you would, go to twit.tv slash survey23 for the year 2023. Twit.tv slash survey23. Uh, take that survey. You have a few more days to do it. Uh, and thanks for, in advance. Hey, everybody. It's Leo Laporte, the uh, founder and host of many of the uh, Twit podcasts. I don't normally talk to you about advertising, but I want to take a moment to do that right now. Um, our mission statement at Twit, we're dedicated to building a highly engaged community of tech enthusiasts. That's our audience and you, I guess, since you're listening, by offering them the knowledge they need to understand and use technology in today's world. To do that, we also create partnerships with trusted brands and make important introductions between them and our audience. It's how we finance our podcasts, but it's also, and our audience tells us this all the time, a part of the service we offer. It's a valued bit of information for our audience members. They want to know about great brands like yours. So can we help you by introducing you to our highly qualified audience? And boy, you get a lot with advertising on the Twit Podcasts. Partnering with Twit means you're going to get, if I may say so humbly, the gold standard in podcast advertising. And we throw in a lot of valuable services. You get a full service continuity team supporting everything from copywriting to graphic design. I don't think anybody else does this or does this as well as we do. You get ads that are embedded in our content that are unique every time. I read them, our hosts read them. We always over deliver on impressions. And frankly, <laughs> We're here to talk about your product. So we really give our listeners a great introduction to what you offer. We've got onboarding services 
ad tech with pod sites. That's free for direct clients. We give you a lot of reporting so you know who saw your advertisement. You'll even know how many responded by going to your website. We'll also give you courtesy commercials that you can share across social media and landing pages. We think these are really valuable. People like me and our other hosts talking about your product sincerely uh, and informationally. Those are incredibly valuable. You also get other free goodies, mentions in our weekly newsletter that's sent out to thousands of fans. We give bonus ads uh, to people who buy a significant amount of advertising. You'll get social media promotion too. But let me tell you, we are looking for an advertising partner that's going to be with us long term. Visit twit.tv slash advertise. Check out our partner testimonials. Tim Broom, founder of IT Pro TV. They started IT Pro TV in 2013, immediately started advertising with us and grew that company to a, a really amazing success. Hundreds of thousands of ongoing customers. They've been on our network for more than 10 years. And they say, and I'll quote Tim, we would not be where we are today without the Twit Network. That's just one example. Mark McCrary, who's the CEO of Authentic, uh, he was actually uh, one of the first people to buy ads on our network. He's been with us for 16 years. He said, and I'm quoting, the feedback from many advertisers over those 16 years across a range of product categories is that if ads and podcasts are going to work for a brand, they're going to work on Twitch shows. I'm proud to say that the ads we do over deliver, they work really well because they're honest. They have integrity. Our audience trusts us and we say, this is a great product. They believe it. They listen. Our listeners are highly intelligent. They're heavily engaged. They're tech savvy. They're dedicated to our network. And that's partly because we only work with high integrity partners that we have thoroughly and personally vetted. I approve every single advertiser on the network. If you're ready to elevate your brand and you've got a great product, I want you to reach out to us. Advertise at twit.tv. So I want you to break out of the advertising norm, grow your brand with host-read authentic ads on twit.tv. Visit twit.tv slash advertise for more details or email us advertise at twit.tv if you're ready to launch your campaign now. It's time for the back of the book. Paul has a tip of the week. I have two tips of the week because <laughs> I don't have an app. Um, the first is a little self-serving, but um, I'm actually working on a new book. Um, it's uh, maybe I should say a new book. Um, I, in 2019 and then again in 2021, uh, wrote a, a fairly epic series of articles that I stupidly called Programming Windows. Uh, which is really about oh, the history so of Windows, good, Paul. but from kind of a programming perspective. It was right? so good. I, I, I mean, I'm already a premium member of Therat.com, but if I hadn't been, I would have joined just for that. It was really Yeah, so I, I've been looking at turning this into a book. So I, oh, I just converted the first half of it, which I sort of think is the like the pre.net era. It was approximately 55 articles. So I think the second half is going to be about the same. And then... Um, it just plain text. I mean, because I, 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 at first I was thinking, I wonder if I can get away with not putting any images in here, but actually I'm going to need images. Um, it's about 226 pages in PDF form. So I'm thinking the final one will be somewhere close to 500. Um, you know, we'll see. I've only done it. It's, it's a, <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's crazy. Um, anyway, I'm going to, I want to put this on lean pub like my other book, uh, books and, um, the question, the, the, the reason I'm mentioning this here right now, because it's not available yet, is I can't call it Programming Windows. Programming Windows is, of course, the name of the Charles Petzold classic Windows programming books. And uh, I'm curious if anyone has any suggestions about what maybe I could call it. I, the issue is that it's kind of developer focused, although it does a lot of the history generally as well. There are code samples and things like that. Um, I like the name Windows Everywhere. Um, I kind of think, you know, it's almost like the rise and fall of dot, dot, dot. You know, it kind of writes itself. But um, the problem is it's, I want to make sure that people understand it's technical. It's sort of a software development focus, you know, but all the different ways that you could write Windows apps over the years and how that changed. So if anyone has ideas, um, let me know, please, because I'm, I need to figure it out. Right now it's called Untitled Windows Book, which is not a great name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, let me think. 
Yeah. yeah. I, know, I mean, weird. program. I you can't use programming Windows. I think that's pretty good. Oh, because that implies uh, it's yeah. how to program Windows. Right. And you want to it's say all, the history of programming. Right. Windows. I was thinking more like uh, you, I could call it like programming Windows, a love story. Um, I don't know. I don't. I, it's it's a tough one. Like I uh, even when I called the series programming Windows, I was like, this is not the best name for this. Um, but yeah, I got to figure that out. <sighs> I'm sure you'll come up with a title. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you're doing anyway, that. Anyway, I, I, that's going to be great. I will will tell that you, be a lean post? Or are you going to continue to yeah, use it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Going through that history again, um, I found myself getting lost in it. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, I think this is, parts, of this, are, parts yeah. of this are great. And there's some really good stories in there. It's 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 really interesting. Okay. Um, anyway, yeah, let me know. Uh, reach out, uh, paulatherat.com if you want to email me about that. Um, so the <laughs> there was a... This is a news story this week that Microsoft is going to, on January 31st, stop allowing people to buy Windows 10 from its website. And I saw you know, this, kind of, and this is so irritating. And it, well, and it's like, well, what does that does that mean? <laughs> you know. So the thing is, um, this is probably not the way almost anyone buys Windows anyway, right? So if you wanted to buy Windows. 10 you could go you could get it on amazon you could get the system builder version what you're really buying here by the way is a, a license key right that's the point um the windows 10 download will be available for the duration uh the windows 8.1 download is still available today by the way um so you'll always be able to download it but if you have a license key you'll be able to install it and activate it um you I haven't tried this in a while, but I believe you could just activate it in the product. It's not like they're not going to sell you the license. But again, this is not the most inexpensive way to buy the product, right? So if you were going to buy Windows 10 from Microsoft, you would spend $140 for the Home Edition or $199 for Pro. You can get it less for that, less than that on Amazon. There are other kind of places you can buy these things, obviously. You could walk into a retail store and buy it in a box if you wanted to do that. Um, so there are ways to do it. I don't... I don't Oh, and I should say, too, if you have a Windows, if for some reason, I don't know who has these things, but if you have a Windows 7 or 8X product key, a retail product key, that still works fine. If you want to clean install Windows 10 or Windows 11, works. that will work. It still, still works. works. Yep. So, I, you know, yeah, it's going away, but it, you're if you really need to buy Windows 10 for some reason, like you're building a PC, uh, buy the System Builder Edition because that's what you're doing and it's cheaper. So those, those, are, those are available on... Amazon new. So Newegg. I always thought that was like a gray area. Like when it you is. buy that yep. from uh, Newegg, you have to buy a heart, a piece of hardware. <laughs> so, yeah. Like a little cable or something. So, so yeah, that yeah. You're a, you know, oh, yeah. I'm a system builder. Uh, yeah. But it's not yeah. like they're stripping those out of the boxes of existing OEM. No, computers. no, no, no. You're not buying anything sketchy. It's a at all. legit. This is legit. Copy oh, yeah, yeah. Windows. Yeah. Okay. Yep. There and, are some and much aren't we sketchier all... ways to buy I know. Windows licenses. I mean, there really are. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's terrible things. To, don't do it. Yep. You'll be sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, so buying the system builders version is okay. And that's going to continue. Yep. Yeah. And we're all system well, you know, builders. Until, and, you know. We are. We absolutely, yeah. we're all developers. Yeah. We're all content creators. We are all system builders. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, Windows 10 is supported through October, I think 23, whatever the date is, 2025. So you still have, you know, two and a half years to go. It's... Uh, but that said, I mean, obviously most people, this is not going to impact almost anybody. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. This is one of those things that's easy to get upset with, but it's like, I, even if you really wanted to install Windows 10 at this point, it's, you're going to be okay. <laughs> you know, this is Steve, to get Steve to. Gibson shocked me. I thought he was at least up to Windows 10. He's still running Windows 7. Jeez Louise. I know. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it was. You know, so I mean, that probably, people. arguably, was the best version of Windows. Yes. <sighs> yeah. No. Yeah. Ten? I, I, Did I you say ten no, is. I, I don't know. No. I. I don't know. I. I. I think the thing about Windows Ten is that to me it, it just looks dated right now. Yeah. But then again, yes, this is the last version. It didn't have a stupid store. It didn't have the mobile app thing right. built into it. The right. mobile app platform. Um. It was the last. It, it was, was the, the it was the height of a certain type of Windows. Classic Windows. Classic desktop Windows. OS. Yeah. 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 And so I see, I mean, I I, I kind of sympathize with Steve. I would love to mm -hmm. continue to run Windows 7, but it's not supported. 
it's just yeah, it's so many products won't even run on it now. Yeah. Um, uh, he says that. I think he says he's having trouble with browsers now. Yep. That's the big yeah, one. That's how it goes. It, and, you know, antivirus will be an issue. Yep. Um, although some are still supporting it. I, to me, it's just basic things like a OneDrive integration with the OS. Like I 100% rely on that. And Windows 7 never supported, if I remember correctly, what we now call files on demand. Um, and it wouldn't matter if it did anyway, because whatever its predecessor was called, which was in Windows 8, they took it away because it was there was a problem with data corruption. Um, and I, I super rely on that. Like I, I, it's a key part of how I work every day. Mm. So that's windows 10, windows 11 for me, you know, I guess you could use Dropbox or something. I don't know <laughs> if they support it, <laughs> you know, I don't know. They probably don't. I mean, on the yeah. other hand, Dropbox just now is starting to support, uh, Mac OS. 10 on uh, Apple Silicon. So, I oh, I okay, know. there you go. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. No, Microsoft took a year to fix the to OneDrive client. They were yeah. running in emulation for a year. Yeah, that's you right. Know? That's right. Yeah, it was terrible. The performance was awful. Yeah. So, normally, uh, Richard right. uh, Campbell, who is our co host, yep. is on, uh, on, uh, on duty in London mm -hmm. uh, this week, uh, would tell us a little bit about whiskey. He is right. a connoisseur. I mean, everything I know about whiskey, I learned from Richard. Uh, same. Yeah. Exactly. But you, yeah. you're going to fill in here with a pick. He's forgotten more about whiskey than I know. So I don't know a lot about whiskey. This is something than... Richard has forgotten is what you're going to do. That's right. Well, I don't know. What, I'm curious what he would think about this. I couldn't think of the name of this. But... So uh, over the holidays, we had some friends visit from Boston. And uh, a friend of mine who knows I like whiskey a lot gave me a bottle of something called Nomad Outland Whiskey, which huh. is, it's I believe it's scotch, but they put it in... Um, Oh God, uh, sherry uh, cases in Spain. <laughs> it's made in <laughs> just Spain. to get the complete. Oh, here, here, uh, it's a pretty yeah, bottle. It's a good. Yeah, that's a good the, gift yeah. bottle. Yeah, I have, actually I have the. I have a bottle right here, half gone. Um, it's a good sign. The thing that's well, but here's the point. So, first of all, it's not super expensive. It's probably about thirty five dollars in the store. Um, it's perfectly sippable as is. Like a lot of times with whiskey and scotch, especially. You need to work on the ice or the water. You know, you can do a little dropper thing and kind of get it to the point where you can kind of drink it without it killing your tongue or whatever. But this, to me, out of the bottle is very, it's sippable. So it's, it's if you're not, if you don't know a lot about whiskey, like I don't, and you're not, you know, just not in this world yet, like this is, I think, a good way to get there because it's a, um, it's, it doesn't require any work. Like it's something I think most people could just kind of appreciate right out of the bottle uh, is an interesting it's, so if they say born in scotland raised in jerez in spain right uh, it's uh, i guess the climate's different so it would it, it makes sense that if that's where you age it it would have a different well you impact. know so the thing about the thing about whiskey bourbons whiskey scotch whatever th there's usually like two markets there's the low-end market which cheap you know like jack daniels or whatever it's the type of thing you would put in a cocktail yeah and then there's the high end stuff the like sipping, uh, sipping whiskey, uh, yeah, abund uh, uh, Abel or abund Abel or whatever. Abundna. Yeah, yeah. Hundred bucks a bottle, hundred fifteen yeah. bucks a bottle, whatever, and up. And you're not going to buy that and put it in a in a cocktail for starters. But you're also not going to buy it and just drink it out of the bottle. <laughs> like it's it's just too it's too strong. It's too it's too much. And so I this to me is like kind of that middle ground thing. It's just it's a step up from the you know the Jack Daniels or whatever you know kind of standard bourbons you might get. Um, but it's also, it's a, it's just a good sipping whiskey. I remember 25 years ago, uh, at mm -hmm. least somebody giving me, uh, a sip of something and he said, this is whiskey, but it was aged in sherry casks. Yeah. And it was a little, just a little bit of sweetness. Incredible. It, it kind of yeah. yeah. It tones down the, the bitterness of, you know, just what, what scotch can be sometimes just, uh, it totally changed my attitude about yeah. whiskey. It wasn't as peaty. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, I don't. I can't stand. I don't. I, personally, I, I don't. Some people are really into yeah, peaty, like, smoky. Like their peat. Yeah. I just. Oh, I can't stand. No. That. And uh, mezcal's like that. I can't. Yeah. Same thing with mezcal. It's very smoky. I, swear to God, I, I am. I'm positive. My wife gets mezcal cocktails, so I can't have any now. I think that's what she's doing. <laughs> positive. 
She's like, oh, you wouldn't like this. Oh, song. you wouldn't. Can it's it's good, Miss Kelly. Can I have some of yours? Yeah. You I'll shouldn't go to some. Oaxaca. I mean, you could have some if you want. You shouldn't go to Oaxaca. <laughs> you, well, I'm going to go anyway for the food. But Oh, uh, the food is so good. But they give you mezcal yeah. constantly. I know. Maybe that's because we were with it. Mike and Amira Elgin. I, I've tried I it so many times <laughs> and I can't. I just don't like it. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think it was a, it was a Glendronach. Mm -hmm. Sherry. Sherry. Uh, it was a Scotch whiskey aged in sherry hmm. and it was very very good as is by the way the abalore but also aged in sherry casks i think that's much more common than it was back then yeah yeah i had never heard of such but you know thing. look we can't all uh, first of all even if that's to your taste and or you said like i, I figured out the magic form oh it was glenn farkless i'm sorry i just found it it was glenn yeah. farkless i remember that but abalore is expensive you know this is yeah five bucks yeah yeah i mean this is a reasonable yeah you know, and you're, it's not like you're not gonna you're not gonna chug this. You're gonna you're gonna sip it. Use small amounts, and um, and you can do it right. Like I said, right out of the bottle. It's nice. Yeah, yeah. Friends, uh, we survived a fabulous episode without Richard. He'll be back next week, however, uh, so Paul yeah, doesn't have to so. go it alone. Uh, Paul Thorat, let's give him I'm a not very going alone, Leo. I I'm here, I but uh, with you, you know, I'm a <laughs> Linux and Lisp and Emacs guy. You know, how much help that's, am I gonna be? That's true. It is kind of a mess. But you know what? <laughs> I am just for you sitting in front of Lenovo running Windows 11. Just for you. So don't worry. Right. right. Uh, are you installing the, Winix, uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux no. while we were speaking? You know, Richard Stallman this week said uh, WSL should be pronounced mm -hmm. Weasel. Oh, jeez. God, dude, give it up. And then he put his cape over his eyes and he laughed and he ran away. <laughs> he, of course, is the founder of the uh, Software Freedom. Yeah. Free he's also the villain foundation. in the next Batman movie, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he's kind of an uh, interesting character. Um, Paul is at Therat.com. Mm -hmm. Please support him. Join the premium because it's worth it. You get so much great stuff. T h u r r o t t dot com. He also publishes his books, and I think this is really generous at leanpub dot com, which means you can set your own price. You download it, you get updates automatically. He's even bundled the field guide for Windows eleven in with Windows ten, so you get both for one price. Windows eleven. Oh, yeah. It's vice versa. Yeah, he's bundled the field guide for Windows ten <laughs> into the field guide for about Windows that. eleven. Yeah. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? We don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but you get it that way, and it's a great way to do it, and, and it supports our friend. Mr. T, he uh, joins us and does this show, works so hard to do it every week, uh, here on uh, Wednesdays, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1900 UTC. You can watch us live at live.twit.tv. If you're watching live, chat live at irc.twit.tv, or, of course, Club Twit members in the Discord. Somebody sent me an email, said, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> I was in the chat. I was in the right. forums. I was in the Mastodon. I never saw a button that said, listen. I was in the, I pay, I was in the Discord. I never see, huh? no, we don't put, a, if you want to listen, you go to the website, twit.tv. <laughs> That's where you listen uh, or download a copy. If you want a copy of this show after the fact available, twit.tv slash WW. We do that. We have little short version names for all the shows. Uh, you could also go to YouTube. There is a, a play button on YouTube if that's what you're looking for. Uh, YouTube.com slash twit is the main channel, but there are channels for every show, including Windows Weekly. Great way to share clips from a show or watch the show uh, at your leisure. I know a lot of people like YouTube for that. And, of course, the easiest thing to do since it is a podcast is subscribe. Uh, just uh, go to your favorite podcast player and search for Windows Weekly. You'll get it automatically. Audio or video. We've got uh, both forms. Ad supported. Of course, if you don't want the ads, check out Club Twit. That's the way to get it without ads. And uh, don't forget Paul's really good hands-on Windows show, which appears weekly in the club. Um, really some good stuff in there. Kind of a visual version of the book, really, right? I mean... Yeah, you would, you do want to watch... This you've been doing a you're doing a series on like kind of logging in and how you know got accounts yeah using accounts and so forth that's really really worth it. <laughs> First one is just my brain dump you know it was like types of types of accounts <laughs> it was like this this is like just uh, how mental I am <laughs> yeah for 13 minutes yeah no you know it's great that's the way I think about that's it. why we like hands on windows. Thank you, Paul. Have a great week. Enjoy a, a little bit of. Uh, Nomad, and uh, we will see you next week right here for Windows Weekly. Bye-bye.
Don't miss All About Android every week. We talk about the latest news, hardware, apps, and now all the developer goodness happening in the Android ecosystem. I'm Jason Howell, also joined by Ron Richards, Florence Ion, and our newest co-host on the panel, Wen Tu Dao, who brings her developer chops. Really great stuff. We also invite people from all over the Android ecosystem to talk about this mobile platform we love so much. Join us every Tuesday, All About Android, on twit.tv.